Section 8 of the History of Prostitution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philip Panos. The History of Prostitution by William Sanger. Section 8. Chapter 6. France. History during the Middle Ages. The Roman accounts of the Gauls represent them as leading virtuous lives. Severa matrimonia is the expression of the historian. This would appear to apply more particularly to the women than to the men. As is usually the case among semi-civilized nations, the Gauls, Germans, Franks, and most of the aboriginal nations of northern Europe imposed upon the women obligations of chastity which they did not always accept for themselves. Adultery, and in certain cases fornication they punished capitally but if the early ecclesiastical writers are to be believed these rude warriors were addicted to coarse debaucheries in which intoxicating liquors and promiscuous intercourse with females played a prominent part the feasts which followed victories in the field or commemorated national anniversaries bore some resemblance to the roman commissationes though of course they lacked the refinement and the wit which occasionally strove to redeem those disgraceful banquets so far as the females were concerned there is no doubt the roman writers judged correctly whether the severity of the climate tempered the ardour of northern sensuality or the harshness of the law kept the passions in check the female population of gaul from the time of the roman conquest for at least two or three centuries was undoubtedly virtuous prostitution was comparatively unknown an old law or usage directed that prostitutes should be stoned but we do not hear of this law being carried into effect simultaneously with the consolidation of the kingdom of the franks we note that concubinage was an established institution recognized by the law and sanctioned by the church all the frank chiefs who could afford the luxury kept harems or as they were called in that day gynesia peopled by young girls who ministered to their pleasures the plan as it appears bore some resemblance to that which is at present in use in turkey and some other mohammedan countries the chief had one lawful and proper wife a sort of sultana valide and other wives whose matrimonial rights were less clearly defined but still whose condition was not necessarily disreputable how the people lived we are not so well qualified to say but no doubt prostitution prevailed to some extent among them though in all probability the public morals were purer than they became towards the tenth and eleventh centuries perhaps the first authentic legislative notice of prostitution in france is to be found in the capitularies of charlemagne that monarch who seems to have seen no mischief in the system of gynesia was severe upon common prostitution he directed vulgar prostitutes to be scourged and a like penalty to be inflicted on all who harboured them kept houses of debauch or lent their assistance to prostitutes or debauchees in other words charlemagne treated the same act as a crime among the poor and as an excusable habit among the rich our information regarding society in the middle ages is necessarily obscure and scanty but we have enough to learn that immorality prevailed to an alarming degree during the tenth eleventh twelfth and thirteenth centuries probably the rich men who had their gynesia were the most virtuous class in the nation most of the kings set an example of loose intercourse with the ladies of the court the armies of the time were noted for the ravages they committed among the female population of the countries where they were quartered both of these classes seem to have yielded the palm of debauchery to the clergy it is a fact well known to antiquaries though visual evidence of it is becoming scarce that most of the great works of gothic architecture which date from this period were profusely adorned with lewd sculptures whose subjects were taken from the religious orders in one place a monk was represented in carnal connection with a female devotee in others were seen an abbot engaged with nuns a naked nun worried by monkeys youthful penitents undergoing flagellation at the hands of their confessor lady abbesses offering hospitality to well-proportioned strangers etc etc 
these obscene works of art formerly encumbered the doors windows arches and niches of many of the finest gothic cathedrals in france modesty has lately insisted on their removal but many of the works themselves have been rescued from destruction by the zeal of antiquaries and it is believed some have still escaped the iconoclastic hand of the modern church when such was the condition of the clergy and such the notoriety of that condition it would be unjustifiable to expect purity of morals among the people louis the eighth made an effort to regulate prostitution it proved fruitless and it was left to the next king of the same name louis the ninth to make the first serious endeavour to check the progress of the evil in france his edict which dates from twelve fifty four directed that all prostitutes and persons making a living indirectly out of prostitution such as brothel keepers and procurers should be forthwith exiled from the kingdom it was partially put in force a large number of unfortunate females were seized and imprisoned or sent across the frontier severe punishments were inflicted on those who returned to the city of paris after their expulsion a panic seized the customers of brothels and for a few months public decency was restored but the inevitable consequences of the arbitrary decree of the king soon began to be felt though the officers of justice had forcibly confined in establishments resembling magdalen hospitals a large proportion of the most notorious prostitutes and exiled many more others arose to take their places a clandestine traffic succeeded to the former open debauchery and in the dark the evils of the disease were necessarily aggravated more than that as has usually been the case when prostitution has been violently and suddenly suppressed the number of virtuous women became less and corruption invaded the family circle tradesmen complained that since the passage of the ordinance they found it impossible to guard the virtue of their wives and daughters against the enterprises of the military and the students at last complaints of the evil effects of the ordinance became so general and so pressing that after a lapse of two years it was repealed a new royal decree re-established prostitution under rules which though not particularly enlightened or humane still placed it on a sounder footing than it had occupied before the royal attention had been directed to the subject prostitutes were forbidden to live in certain parts of the city of paris were not allowed to wear jewellery or fine stuffs and were placed under the direct supervision of a police magistrate whose official or popular title was le roi de ribaud the king of ribaldry the duties of this officer appear to have been analogous to those of the roman ediles who had charge of prostitution he was empowered to arrest and confine females who infringed the law either in their dress their domicile or their behaviour it was afterward urged against the maintenance of the office of roi de ribaud that it was usually filled by reckless depraved men who discharged its duties more in view of their private interests and the gratification of their sensuality than from regard to the public morals instances of gross tyranny were proved against them and in the absence of evidence to show that their appointment had been beneficial to the public but little regret was felt when the office was abolished by francis i to return to louis the ninth in his old age he repented of what he had done and returned to the spirit of his early ordinance in his instructions to his son and successor he adjured him to remove from his country the shameful stain of prostitution and indicated plainly enough that the best mode of attaining that end would be by re-enacting the ordinance of twelve fifty four philip dutifully fulfilled his father's request prostitution was again declared a legal misdemeanor and a formidable array of penalties was again brought to bear against offending females and their accomplices but like many a legislative act in more modern times philip's ordinance was too obviously at variance with public policy and popular sentiment to be carried into effect it was quietly allowed to remain a dead letter and with probably few exceptions the prostitutes of paris pursued their calling unmolested 
a few years afterward its nullification was authoritatively sanctioned by fresh sumptuary laws a royal edict directed courtesans to wear a shoulder knot of a particular colour as a badge of their calling the whole force of the government was rallied to enforce this rule and also those which had been enacted by louis the ninth the records of the court contain innumerable reports of the arrests of prostitutes for violating these enactments when they had taken up their abode in a prohibited street they were imprisoned and dislodged when their offence was wearing unlawful garments or jewellery the forbidden objects were seized and sold the constable apparently sharing the proceeds of the sale pimps and procurers were dealt with more severely as usual the statute book contained a variety of conflicting enactments on this subject and menaced them with all kinds of penalties from burning alive to fine and imprisonment it appears beyond a doubt that during the thirteenth and fourteenth centuries several notorious procuresses were burned alive at paris others were put in the pillory were scourged and had their ears cropped while many of the richer class escaped with a fine there are records of cases in which the procuress was exposed naked to the insults of a mob for a whole day and toward evening the hair on her body was burned off with a flaming torch others again were chased through the city in a state of nudity and pelted with stones these barbarous penalties appear to have been very much to the taste of the people procuresses have always been an odious class and it is not surprising to find the punishment of a notorious wretch of the class was observed as a joyous holiday by the populace of the french capital on the other hand the prostitutes themselves were often subjects of public sympathy peculiar reasons operated at this period to produce a favourable sentiment with regard to prostitutes the horrible depravities of the templars were becoming known society was horror-struck at the symptom of a revival of the worst vice of the ancients there have been as is known ingenious and eloquent efforts made in comparatively recent times to throw a veil over the corruptions of the templars and to prove they fell victims to royal jealousy but the argument is not sustained by the facts documents on whose authenticity and credibility no possible suspicion can be cast establish incontrovertibly that the sect of the templars was tainted with unnatural vices and that one of the chief secrets of its maintenance was the facility it afforded to debased men for the gratification of monstrous propensities that this was the opinion which prevailed in paris at the time of the outburst which finally led to the suppression of the order there is no room to question it is easy to understand how the horror such discoveries must have awakened would lead men to entertain more lenient views with regard to a vice which had at least the merit of being in conformity with natural instinct thus far of paris only during the middle ages as is well known most of the provinces of france were self-governing communities which administered their own affairs and received no police regulations from the crown a complete examination of the subject throughout france would therefore involve as many histories as there were provinces our space of course forbids anything of the kind and we can only glance at leading divisions most of the northern people had adopted partly from the old germanic constitutions and partly from the roman law severe provisions against prostitution but they were nowhere apparently put in force occasionally a notorious brothel keeper or professional procuress was severely punished but prostitutes were rarely molested in the north and west of france indeed toleration was obviously the natural policy for we are not led to believe that in that section of country the evil was ever carried to great excess in normandy brittany picardy and the great northern and western provinces a virtuous simplicity was the rule of life among the peasants and even the cities did not present any striking contrast in many provinces usage not fortified by the text of any custom allowed the seigneur to levy toll upon prostitutes exercising their calling within the limits of his jurisdiction some old titles and records refer to this practice one sets down the tax paid by each prostitute at four deniers to the seigneur 
others intimate that the tax may be paid in money or in kind at the option of the seigneur in many seigneuries this singular tax was regarded with the contempt it deserved in the south of france we meet with a different spectacle there prostitution had long been a deeply seated feature of society the warm passions of the southerners required a vent and in the absence of some safety valve it was obvious to all that the ungovernable lusts of the men would soon kindle the inflammable passions of the dark southern women public houses of prostitution were therefore established in three of the largest cities of the south toulouse avignon and montpellier that of toulouse was established by royal charter which declared that the profits of the enterprise should be shared equally by the city and the university the building appropriated for the purpose was large and commodious bearing the name of the grand abbaye in it were lodged not only the resident prostitutes of the city but any loose women who travelled that way and desired to exercise their impure calling it would appear that they received a salary from the city and that the fees exacted from the customers were divided between the two public bodies to which the enterprise was granted they were obliged to wear white scarves and white ribbons or cords on one of their arms as a badge of their calling when the unfortunate monarch charles the sixth visited toulouse the prostitutes of the abbaye met him in a body and presented an address the king received them graciously and promised to grant them whatever largesse they should request they begged to be released from the duty of wearing the white badges and the king faithful to his promise granted the boon a royal declaration specially exempted them from the old rule but the people of toulouse no doubt irritated by the want of some distinguishing mark between their wives and daughters and the foolish women by common consent mobbed the prostitutes who availed themselves of the king's ordinance none of them could venture to appear in public without being liable to insult and even bodily injury resolutely bent on carrying their point the women shut themselves up in the abbaye and did their best to keep customers at a distance their calculation was just the city and the university soon felt the effects of the diminution of visitors at the abbaye the corporation appealed to the king and when during the disorders which distracted france at that time charles the seventh visited toulouse a formal petition was presented him by the capitans praying that he would take such steps as his wisdom might seem fit to mediate between the prostitutes and the people and restore to the abbaye its former prosperity the king acted with energy he denounced the assailants of the prostitutes in the severest language and planted his own royal fleurs de lis over the door of the abbaye as a protection to the occupants but the people did not respect the royal arms any more than they did the foolish women on the contrary assaults on the abbaye became more numerous than ever the prostitutes complained incessantly of having suffered violence at the hands of wild youths who refused to pay for their pleasures and the civic authorities proving incompetent to check the disorder the prostitutes found themselves compelled to seek refuge in a new part of the city where it is to be presumed they enlisted adequate support among their own individual acquaintances for a hundred years they inhabited their new domicile in peace and quiet the university then dislodging them in order to occupy the spot the city built them a new abbaye beyond the precincts of the respectable wards it was called the chateau vert and its fame and profits equalled that of the old abbaye about the middle of the sixteenth century the city yielded to the scruples of some moralists of the day and ceded the revenues of the chateau vert to the hospitals but the grant being made on condition that the hospitals should receive and cure all females attacked by venereal disease it was found after six years trial that it cost more than it yielded the hospitals surrendered the chateau to the city it happened just at this time that many eminent philosophers and economists were advocating a return to the old ecclesiastical policy of suppressing prostitution altogether after a discussion which lasted several years the city of toulouse adopted these views and closed the chateau vert 
a magistrate high in authority left on record his protest against this course founded on the scenes of immorality he had himself witnessed in the suburbs and country in the neighbourhood of toulouse but the city authorities adhered to their opinion and contented themselves with arresting some of the most shameless of the free prostitutes from that time forth prostitution at toulouse was subject to the same rules as in the rest of france the history of prostitution at montpellier was analogous at an early period the monopoly which the crown had granted to the city being farmed out to individuals fell into the hands of two bankers in whose family it remained for several generations during their tenure a brothel was established in the city by a speculator of the day but the holders of the monopoly prosecuted him and obtained a perpetual injunction restraining him from lodging or harbouring prostitutes at avignon prostitution was legalized by jane of naples just before the session of the city to the pope the ordinance establishing a public brothel seems to have been drawn with care and though doubts have lately been thrown on its authenticity they are not so well founded as to justify its rejection prostitutes were ordered to live in the brothel they were bound to wear a red shoulder knot as a badge of their calling the brothel was to be visited weekly by the bailli and a barber the latter of whom was to examine the girls and confine separately all who seemed infected no jew was allowed to enter the brothel on any pretext its doors were to be closed on saints days and special regulations guarded against the prevalence of scenes of riot and disorder this ordinance seems to have remained in force during the whole occupation of avignon by the popes and its penalties were occasionally inflicted on offenders but if petrarch and other contemporary writers are to be believed the city was none the less a refuge for debauchees and a scandal to christendom petrarch complains that it was far more depraved than old rome and a popular proverb confirms at least in part his opinion there were however in some southern provinces severe laws against prostitution although some of the penalties seem to have been framed as much with the view of stimulating as of repressing the passions in one or two cities we find accounts of prostitutes and their customers being forced to walk naked through the streets by way of expiation in others the punishment of the iron cage was inflicted on pimps and procuresses when a procuress had rendered herself particularly obnoxious she was seized stripped naked and dragged in the midst of a great crowd to the water's side there she was thrust into an iron cage in which she was forced to kneel when the cage door was closed she was thrown into the river and allowed to remain under water long enough to produce temporary suffocation this shocking punishment was repeated several times a potent influence over the morals of the southern people the higher classes at least was exercised by the institution of chivalry it was of the essence of that institution to promote spiritual at the expense of sensual gratification the chevalier adored his mistress in secret for years without even venturing to breathe her name for years he carried a scarf or ribbon in her honour through battle scenes and dangers of every kind happy when after a lustrum spent in sighs and hopes the charmer condescended to reward his fidelity with a gracious smile it is evident that sexual intercourse must have been rare among people who set so high a value on the merest compliments and slightest tokens of affection nor can there be any question but the effect of chivalry was to impart a high tone to the feelings and language of society and to soften the manners of all who came within its influence if on the other hand we glance at the literature which flourished in france during the period of the revival of learning we cannot but infer that the morals of the people at large were not pure during the thirteenth fourteenth and fifteenth centuries the standard reading of the educated classes among the french was the celebrated roman de la rose a work of remarkable talent but at the same time distinguished by a cynic vein of philosophy and a singular obscenity of language no portion of that work was wholly free from lewd expressions and it would be impossible to quote fifty lines of it to-day in a modern language the doctrine of the author with regard to women was insulting and cynical 
they were uniformly depicted as being restrained only by legal difficulties from giving way to the loosest passions and all men in like manner were painted as seducers adulterers and violators of young girls such was the reading of the best society in france the roman de la rose was to them what shakespeare is to us nor was it alone of its kind of the works which that age has bequeathed to us nearly all are tainted with the same grossness of language and pruriency of idea all or nearly all breathe the air of the brothel it was rather a matter of boasting than shame with the authors villon and regnier seem to plume themselves on their familiarity with scenes of debauch and their extensive acquaintance among the prostitute class the best of their works are descriptions of episodes of dissipation their most lively sketches have prostitutes or their fortunes or their diseases for the themes they seemed to fancy they were imitating horace when they borrowed his most odious blemishes some of them were actors as well as poets and used the machinery of the stage to disseminate their lewd compositions though it was still unusual or even unlawful for women to appear on the stage in their time the boys who played female parts were well drilled to the business and the performances which delighted the towns and villages of france fell but little short in point of grossness of the theatrical enormities of the imperial era at rome one may form some idea of the popularity of erotic literature at this period in france from the amazing vocabulary of erotic terms which is gathered from the works of rabelais beral de verville Renier, Brantome, and their contemporaries. There was not a form of lewdness for which an appropriate name had not been invented, and as to the ordinary acts and instruments of prostitution, a dictionary of synonyms might have been compiled without embracing all of them. Monsieur Dufour, in his conscientious work, fills a couple of pages with the mere words that were employed to express the act of fornication many events likewise indicate a loose state of morals the history of the incubes and the succubes filling some space in every treatise on demonology is a most curious feature of the morals of the day the existence of demons who made a practice of assailing the virtue of girls and boys was admitted by some of the fathers of the church who quoted the words of genesis in support of the singular doctrine they were of two kinds incubi from the latin incubare male demons who assailed the chastity of girls and succubi female demons who robbed boys of their innocence the old chronicles are full of accounts of the mischievous deeds of these evil spirits as might be expected the incubi were more numerous and more enterprising than the succubi for one boy who confessed that a female demon had attacked him in his sleep and compelled him to minister to her sensuality there were a score of girls who furnished very tolerable evidence of having yielded their virginity to creatures of the male gender who they were satisfied could be none other than devils the ecclesiastical writers of the period have preserved a number of scandalous stories of the kind which were so well credited that pope innocent the eighth felt impelled to issue a bull on the subject and provide the faithful with an efficacious formula of exorcism females most of whom appeared to be nuns confessed that they had been subject to the scandalous visits of the demons for long periods of time and that neither fasting nor prayer nor spiritual exercise could release them from the hated plague some girls were brought to admit a similar intercourse and were burnt at the stake as partakers of the nature of sorceresses married women made similar confessions they stated that they were able to affirm that intercourse with demons was extremely painful that their frigid nature combined with their monstrous proportions rendered their society a severe affliction independently of the sin it was noticed that the women married or single who applied to the ecclesiastical authorities for relief from this curious form of torment were almost invariably young and pretty in the year sixteen thirty seven a public discussion took place at paris on the question whether there exist succubi and incubi and whether they can procreate their species the discussion was long and elaborate 
it was conducted by a body of learned doctors in the presence of a large audience composed partly of ladies and while the judgment of the tribunal appeared to be in the negative it was not so emphatic as to settle the question even a century later when one of the royal physicians undertook to explode the theory of lewd demons and to prove that girls had endeavoured to conceal their intercourse with lovers by attributing to them a devilish character the public was not convinced and the incubi were not left without believers the laws still pronounced the penalty of death against all persons male or female who had commerce with demons Another practice which was brought to a close about the same time was entitled Le Sabbat de Sorcières, the Witch's Vigil. It appears that at the earliest times of which we have any record, the inhabitants of France and Germany were in the habit of frequenting nocturnal assemblies in which witchcraft was believed or pretended to occupy a prominent place. In the thirteenth century they were denounced by Pope Gregory the Ninth, who was satisfied that the devil had to do with them, and that their prime object was the gratification of sensuality his bull did not attain its object the witches meetings were still held or believed to have been held throughout the fourteenth fifteenth and part of the sixteenth centuries the popular belief was that the persons in league with witches anointed their bodies with magical ointment bestrode a broom and were forthwith carried through the air to the place of meeting that satan was present at the ceremony in the form of a huge he-goat and received the homage of the witches and their proselytes that songs and dances followed next in order and that the whole performance was closed with a scene of promiscuous debauchery the inquisition took the matter in hand and obtained affidavits from several females averring that they had had commerce with demons on these occasions and relating with singular crudity the peculiar sensations they experienced on the strength of this evidence prosecutions were instituted and many persons were condemned and executed it has been usual in modern times to regard the persecution of the witches as a proof of the barbarous intolerance of the ancient church but in truth a careful examination of the evidence leaves no room for doubting that witchcraft was only the cloak of real vices most of the persons who were burned in france as sorcerers had really used the popular belief in magic to hide their own debaucheries and had succeeded in depraving large numbers of youth of both sexes it was stated by a theological writer of the time of francis i that in his day there were one hundred thousand persons sold to satan in france allowing for some exaggeration it must still be inferred from this statement that this form of prostitution had assumed alarming proportions nor is there any good reason for doubting but priests and other persons of lewd propensities turned the simplicity of the village girls to account in very many instances and richly earned the severe penalty that was inflicted upon them by the arm of the church the vigil or sabbat disappears from history during the sixteenth century that it had been for some time before its extinction a haunt of debauchees and a fertile source of prostitution the writers on demonology and the old chroniclers establish incontrovertibly other aids to prostitution were obtained from the very ranks of the church during the middle ages numbers of strange sects appeared many of which relied for success on the favour they allowed to sensuality at the present day it is not easy to determine what proportion of the stories that are in print respecting many of these sects were the fruit of sectarian jealousy on the part of their rivals some of them were doubtless calumniated but there are others about whose character and practices there is no room for controversy the flagellants for instance who counted eight hundred thousand proselytes in france in the fourteenth century were unquestionably depraved they marched in procession men and women together through the cities of france each member of the society using the whip freely on the bare back of the person before him and at night they assembled in country places and proceeded to more serious flagellations 
the opinion of learned persons ascribed erotic effects to these flagellations it being said apparently with truth that when the flagellants had excited their senses by their discipline they gave way to frantic debauchery however this be it is plain that the spectacle of naked men and women marching in procession and scourging one another cannot but have been provocative of prostitution another similar sect was the adamites who argued that nudity was the law of nature and that clothes were an abomination in the sight of god it is said that at first the adamites insisted on nudity only during their religious exercises and that their proselytes stripped themselves within the place of worship but one picard who became a leading authority in the sect took the ground that their principles should be carried out boldly in the face of the world he and his followers male and female accordingly appeared in the streets in the costume in which they were born the inquisition very properly laid hands on them punished some and exiled the others again if we pass from individual accidents to the state of society at large we shall find many features that cannot have been aids to virtue allusion has already been made to the obscene character of much of the early poetry of france and to the excessive grossness of those works especially which obtained and perhaps deserved the widest popularity many of the customs of the day were equally averse to sound morals to cite one by way of example on the jour des innocentes which fell on the twenty eighth of december men were allowed to invade the bedchambers of girls and if they could find them in bed to administer the chastisement which used to be common in schools hence arose the proverbial expression donner les innocentes à quelqu'un which meant to birch a person on the bare skin no doubt the old chroniclers were justified in saying that when the girl was worth the trouble the invader of the chamber was not satisfied with inflicting a chastisement marriages were attended with ceremonies far grosser than any that were practised in rome it was not only decorous it was fashionable both for men and women to spy out the bedchamber of the newly wedded couple and the fortunate man or girl who had contrived to see the interior of the room through a chink in the wall or a hole in the door was loudly applauded when the result of his or her discoveries was made known the invention of bridal chambers is therefore not a original in america as some have supposed strange to say neither the lewdness of the poets nor the grossness of the social habits of the times strikes one as more singular than the tone of the sermons which were delivered in paris at the same period one of the most famous preachers of the day was maillard who rose to eminence under louis the eleventh his sermons on the luxury and corruptions of the times were very popular we find him cursing the burgesses who for the sake of gain let their houses to prostitutes vultis vivere de posterioribus meretricum he cries indignantly he denounces with extraordinary virulence the crimes of impudicity which are committed in churches and which the pillars and knave would denounce if they had eyes and a voice he did not spare his congregation turning fiercely to the women who sat before him he apostrophized them dictatis vos mulieres possuistis possuistis filias ad peccandum vos mulieres per vestros traitos impudiae provocastis alios ad peccandum et vos macruelle quid dicitis he thunders against this latter class the procuresses who ought he says to be burned at the stake especially when as is often the case they are both the mothers and the vendors of their daughters words fail him to denounce the intercourse of abandoned women with ecclesiastics he invokes the divine wrath upon those of his congregation qui dont corpus curialibus monachis presbyteris both he and other famous preachers of the day pronounced maledictions upon lewd convents which some of them say are mere seraglios for the bishops and monks where every abomination is practised it was estimated at this time say the fifteenth century when paris was comparatively a small city it contained five to six thousand prostitutes who were said by an italian to be far more beautiful and attractive than any prostitutes he had seen elsewhere end of section eight
Section 9 of the History of Prostitution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philip Panos. The History of Prostitution by William Sanger. Section 9. Chapter 7. France. History from the Middle Ages to Louis the Thirteenth. The memoranda we have already given will enable the reader to form an idea of the state of society at large. It remains to say something of the court, which in some respects was France. From Louis the Ninth to Charles V inclusive, it is said that the kings of France set no example of debauchery, and that the court rather encouraged virtue than vice when the sisters-in-law of philip the handsome scandalized paris by their loose life in the tour de nel into which they were said to have made a practice of inveigling students whom they assassinated when their lubricity was satiated the king had them brought to punishment and dealt with as though the popular scandal was well founded in fact when charles the sixth ascended the throne the scene changed this unfortunate monarch was not only himself weak and depraved but his wife isabel of bavaria was more vicious still the pair encouraged every practice that could shock modesty or outrage decency the queen lived almost openly with her lover the duke of orleans the king so long as he retained his reason was a leading actor in the scandalous masquerades of the court and narrowly escaped losing his life on one occasion when he disguised himself as a devil and danced immodestly before the ladies of the court round his loins as round those of his fellow demons a sort of girdle of tow had been fastened and all the masqueraders were chained together in the midst of their dances some foolish person threw a lighted torch at them their girdles took fire and all were burned to death except the king whom the duchess of berry saved by courageously raising her skirts and throwing them over the burning monarch charles had had many mistresses in his youth when he went mad the physicians directed the queen to refuse to discharge her conjugal duty charles had enough of his former nature left to resent this privation he even employed force and succeeded at last in compelling his wife to resume her place in the royal couch she contrived however to defraud him by hiring a pretty girl to take her place it is said charles never detected the fraud his wife meanwhile gave the reins to her loose passions and was known to have had at least a score of lovers a very striking picture of the manners of the time is afforded by the story of agnes sorel she was as is known the mistress of charles the seventh a lady of good family and otherwise than as the king's mistress of spotless reputation her influence over the king she used for the best of purposes it was she who roused him to make the efforts which eventually expelled the foreigner from france her private character was laudable she was amiable generous kind and true yet when she visited paris in the company of the king the crowd followed her whenever she appeared in the streets insulting her and calling her a prostitute in the grossest terms the king lived with her eighteen years but never ventured to acknowledge her publicly as his mistress of the four daughters she bore him three only were legitimated by his successor louis the eleventh had a seraglio and a colony of bastards before he became king nor did he alter his mode of life when he assumed control of the kingdom his favourites were usually chosen from the lowest class of his subjects many of whom had gone through an apprenticeship for the king's service in the houses of prostitution of the capital louis never pretended to bear them any affection he used them as he used the men of letters who composed for his diversion the lewd tales which have reached us charles the eighth appears to have been more virtuous than his predecessors though of course he did not pique himself upon any conjugal fidelity a story is told which reflects credit on his character it is said that during his campaign in italy when he retired to his chamber one evening he found there a young girl of marvellous beauty in a state of complete deshabille she was kneeling and in tears when the king entered on charles inquiring the cause of her sorrow 
she confessed that her parents had sold her to the king's valet for the use of his majesty and conjured charles to spare her the king was touched by her distress he inquired into the facts and finding that they were as she stated and further that she was betrothed to a youth of the neighbourhood he sent for him and married the young couple forthwith it appears certain that charles's death was caused by his indiscreet commerce with the sex all the chroniclers state that he fell a victim to the indulgence of his passions being frail of body and of feeble constitution the court of louis the twelfth was purer than that of his predecessors owing to the austere virtue of the queen louis himself had shared the profligacies of his family in his youth but on becoming king he allowed his wife to regulate his household according to her principles for the first time for many years say the old chroniclers prostitution was banished from court we shall have something to say of francis i in connection with syphilis of which he was a conspicuous and an early victim at the age of eighteen his mother stated that he had been punished where he sinned the misfortune did not operate as a warning his life was notoriously dissolute at a time when profligacy was so much the rule that it was hardly likely to be noticed brantome asserts positively that his expedition to italy was prompted by the desire to make acquaintance with a courtesan of milan whose charms admiral bonnevet had extolled previous to his time it seems there had always been attached to the court a body of prostitutes for the use of the courtiers francis suppressed this body and actually invited the ladies of the court to take their place brantome reviews this policy and while he praises it in view of the joyous pastimes to which it led he is bound to acknowledge that it produced the greatest immorality ever known in france the ladies of the town followed the example of those of the court and but little was wanting but that every woman in france became a prostitute it was the custom during this reign for the king to invite all his courtiers and their wives and daughters to lodge at the royal palaces from time to time the ladies had apartments by themselves and to each room the king had a key we are assured that the husbands fathers and brothers of ladies who refused to submit to the royal demands had but little chance of retaining their offices if they had been guilty of maladministration or peculation as was the case with most of them they could hope for pardon only through the complaisance of their female relatives the story of monsieur de saint vallier who was reprieved on the scaffold in payment for the favours which his daughter the beautiful diana of poictiers had granted to the king is too well known to need repetition here it was the boast of francis that he had always respected the honour of the ladies of the court and the boast was just from his point of view his visits to his mistresses were always made in a mysterious manner and at night even to the duchess of etampes who was his acknowledged mistress and procuress for a period of nearly twenty years he never behaved in public in a manner to compromise her reputation in private he was not so scrupulous when this lady's husband disturbed the king one evening francis drew his sword on him and threatened to kill him instantly if he dared reveal what every one knew or to punish the wife at whose adultery he had connived for years his idea seems to have been that words alone constituted the sin of debauchery on one occasion he took all the ladies of the court to see the royal deer in the rutting season but when a gentleman ventured a very obvious pleasantry on the scene he exiled him from the court for life his death has been frequently described some writers imply by their silence doubts of the authenticity of the story of la belle ferronniere but it rests on very tolerable evidence 
this lady who was uncommonly beautiful was the wife of a lawyer or a merchant the authorities do not agree on the point the king solicited her favours but strange to say was met with a positive refusal on consultation with the court lawyers however francis was informed that he could by exercise of his royal prerogative enjoy the company of any woman he pleased and the ferronniere was accordingly notified that the king commanded her to yield to his desires she confided the order to her husband who on reflection counselled her to submit meanwhile ferronniere himself used his best endeavours to catch a syphilitic disease which he communicated to his wife she gave it to the king who died of it after much suffering henry the second had the merit of fidelity not to his wife but to his mistress the latter was the famous diana de poictiers whose successful intercession with francis i on her father's behalf has already been noticed brantome asserts that she did not emulate the constancy of her royal lover saying that in her youth she had obliged many persons he tells a story which if true reflects credit on the temper of the king visiting his mistress one day he surprised her in the company of a courtier named brissac who had only time to hide himself under the bed after spending some moments with diana the king asked for some refreshments some boxes of confectionery were brought him and in the midst of his meal he took a box and threw it under the bed saying hallo brissac everybody must live diana lost no portion of her lover's heart in consequence of her infidelities this she owed in some degree to her extraordinary beauty which she preserved so late in life that it was commonly reported she was in the habit of using soap made of liquid gold henry was proud of his mistress and never concealed their liaison he had his arms interwoven with hers on many public buildings and pieces of plate he used constantly to ride through the streets with the beautiful diana on his crupper and he showed her so marked a preference over his wife that judicious courtiers never made the mistake of courting the latter but the orderly life of the king was not imitated by the court according to brantome and sauval the excesses of the age of francis were aggravated under henry it was rare says the former that ladies presented their virginity to their husbands and husbands who objected to the intimacy of their wives with kings princes noblemen and others of the court were issued from society a woman was held to be virtuous because she begged her lover to wait till she was married to gratify his desires married women who retained their love for the same gallant for several years were considered models of purity brantome intimates distinctly that ordinary debauchery fell short of the desires of the courtiers incest sodomy and similar enormities could alone satiate the passions of the old debauchees of the day the same writer partially explains the spread of vice by saying that within the last half century the ladies of france had acquired the arts of italy nor is it doubtful that with the medicis many of the monstrous vices which have been peculiar to italy ever since the age of imperial rome were imported into france we hear all kinds of instruments of debauchery of lewd books and lewd pictures of indecent sculptures and bronzes being sold without let or hindrance in the stores of paris it was the age of aretino and besides that famous or infamous writer a number of other italians had competed for the prize of lewdness in composition poets painters sculptors seemed to try how far art could be prostituted cellini leonardo da vinci giulio romano niccolo dell'abate and indeed almost all their contemporaries debased their genius by the execution of indecent works many of these found their way to paris when pope clement the seventh undertook to prosecute authors of indecent books whether in letters or art most of the compositions that were endangered by his bull were transported to france brantome alludes to many of them as being quite common in his time he describes for instance a silver goblet on which the most indecent scenes were graven and which a nobleman of the court always obliged the ladies who visited him to use at table other noblemen had their rooms painted in fresco in similar taste 
it is stated that anne of austria caused three hundred thousand écus worth of frescoes of this kind to be removed from the ceilings of the palace at fontainebleau but in the reign of henry the second it does not appear that any one was ever prosecuted for dealing in this kind of merchandise during the three following reigns it was catherine of medicis who gave the tone to the court and really ruled the kingdom all historians concur in stating that she used prostitution as the mainspring of her policy she had a court of sometimes two to three hundred ladies of honour whom she employed to worm out the secrets of the politicians of the day they were known as the queen's flying squadron and it appears they performed their duties successfully of course at the cost of whatever virtue or decency the court still retained Brantome is still our authority for asserting that they introduced a new feature of debauchery. They took the initiative in affairs of this kind, and instead of yielding to the entreaties of lovers, it was they who pressed their lovers to meet them halfway. He likewise informs us that they aided the establishment in France of other vices, which had hitherto been peculiar to southern and eastern climates, by the revival of practices which had been common among the hetere of Athens it has been asserted that catherine wilfully tutored her children in habits of debauchery in order to divert their minds from politics and retain control over the kingdom but this scandal does not appear to rest on authentic evidence it is unquestionable however that charles the ninth the author of the massacre of saint bartholomew lived in incestuous intercourse with his sister margaret and there seems no reason to doubt the truth of the story that catherine more than once entertained the king and court at a banquet at which nude females served as waiters perhaps the best idea of the morals of the time can be obtained from the adventures of the margaret just mentioned who married henry the fourth king of navarre and afterward king of france it is said that at the age of eleven she had two lovers both of whom claimed to have robbed her of her virtue marrying the king of navarre she found means to leave her husband and reside at paris whose air suited her better than the country here her debaucheries were a common theme of scandal her lovers being counted by the score happening at last to give birth to a child which mysteriously disappeared her brother henry the third sent her to her husband in a quasi disgrace henry of navarre refused to cohabit with her the king vainly endeavoured to reconcile the couple with more zeal than tact he used as an argument with his cousin that the mother of the king of navarre had not herself led an irreproachable life at this henry burst into a laugh and remarked to the envoy that the king was very complimentary in his letters his majesty having in the first described the vices of the wife and in the second alluded to the frailties of the mother he persisted in refusing to receive margaret and she took refuge in the little town of Agen. but no sooner began to lead her usual life there than the people rose and expelled her she found a second refuge in the fortress of usson and there she lived twenty years in a sort of prison which she converted into a brothel she was debarred from the society of men of fashion and courtiers but for her purposes servants secretaries musicians and even the peasants of the neighbourhood answered as well and of these there was no lack returning to paris in her old age she did not alter her course of life she became outwardly devout and established a nunnery and monastery near her hotel the latter the people said in order to have monks always at hand but the list of her lovers remained undiminished to the very verge of her death nor did her husband present any striking contrast to his wife though he reflected so severely upon her in the work published under the title le divorce satirique bayle remarks that had he not expended so large a portion of his energy in the pursuit of sensual pleasures he would have been one of the greatest heroes of history he was profuse and indiscriminate in his attachments duchess or farmer's daughter it was all the same to him he changed his mistress once a month at least as an exception to this rule his affection for gabrielle d'estray a very lovely creature whom he shared with the marquis of bellegarde and who bore him or them three children lasted several years he was not faithful to her and made no secret of his infidelities but he loved her passionately 
on one occasion he left his army in the midst of a campaign disguised himself as a peasant and travelled through the enemy's country to meet her he once went to see her but was stopped at the door with the announcement that bellegarde was with her his first impulse was one of rage drawing his sword he rushed towards the door but stopped halfway and saying no it would make her angry he returned home Gabrielle was a very beautiful and charming person. She was in the habit of having herself painted in a state of perfect nudity, with her children playing around her. When she died, Henry proposed to replace her by Mademoiselle d'Entragues, whose beauty had made some sensation at court. Negotiations were opened with the lady, who dutifully placed the matter in the hands of her family, and father, mother, and brothers began to treat with the king for the prostitution of their daughter and sister. They asked a hundred thousand crowns. The king thought the sum large and offered them fifty thousand, but the family refusing to give way, he acceded to their demands. They then added that they would like to have a promise of marriage, conditioned upon the ladies bearing a male child within a year. To this, likewise, Henry agreed, in spite of Sully's remonstrances, and Mademoiselle d'Entragues became the acknowledged mistress of the king. It need not be added that the promise of marriage was never fulfilled. Some time afterward, Henry fell in love with a young lady who was betrothed to Marshal Bassompierre. As ardent as ever, he sent for the marshal, explained his feelings, and ordered Bassompierre to renounce his claims. The marshal obeyed, and Henry married the lady, who was a Montmorency, to the Prince of Condé. The marriage was hardly over before the king opened negotiations with the bride. It will scarcely be credited that the emissary he employed was the mother of the Prince of Condé, who left no means untried to effect the dishonour of her son. The prince, of less complacent temper than most other courtiers, refused to allow his wife to become the king's mistress. He removed her from France, and, just as Henry was about to send after her, the assassin Ravaillac freed Condé from the danger the disorders of henry the third the predecessor of the king of navarre are shamefully notorious there was a time during his reign when for the same reason which induced the establishment of dicteria at athens prostitution almost seemed a desirable institution at paris in his youth he had been a famous seducer of the ladies of honour an anecdote of his life at this period not only reveals the tone of the court but happily shows that depravity was not so universal as might be imagined when henry was chosen king of poland he was anxious to settle his mistress mademoiselle de chateauneuf by finding her a husband he applied to a courtier the provost of paris monsieur de nantonier but received the scathing reply that monsieur de nantonier would not marry a prostitute till the king had established brothels in the louvre it is best, perhaps, to throw a veil over the later stories of Henry the Third, his mignon, and the frightful infamies that were practised in Paris in his time. They may be divined from the fact that Brantome mentions some orgies in which the king and a party of friends, male and female, stripped themselves naked and tried to place themselves on a level with the brute creation as rather redeeming instances of his sensuality. We shall take occasion hereafter to follow the history of the court from Louis the Thirteenth to modern times. Meanwhile, some features of society bearing on prostitution in the age we have sketched must be briefly noted. It is asserted by all the chroniclers that the influence of the League was most pernicious. A sort of religious enthusiasm seems to have been kindled by the sectarian strife of the period, and practices which purported to be religious but were only immoral were encouraged by the highest authorities religious fanaticism ruled throughout france men and women walked naked in processions which were led by the curates as was natural at an age of civil war violence was freely used towards females by both of the contending armies at every city that was taken either by the leaguers or by the huguenots all the women married and single were violated by the soldiery such at least is the statement of a contemporary historian moreover in the general confusion no proper police was enforced either at paris or elsewhere and the windows of print shops teemed with lewd pictures which no one says the historian thought of having seized it was in fact a period of anarchy 
the moyen de parvenir by Bewald de Vanil, which has reached us affords some criterion of the popular literature of the day aretino text and plates was much in vogue and sanchez and benedicti left their lay rivals far behind in the composition of works which may contend for the palm of lewdness with martial or petronius throughout the middle ages and indeed up to the middle of the seventeenth century great complaint was made by the clergy of the indecency of dress of the people of france about the thirteenth century it became fashionable to adorn the toe of the shoe or boot with an ornament in metal either a lion's claw or an eagle's beak or something of that kind some immodest person ventured to substitute a sexual image in bronze for the usual appendage and the fashion soon became general women even adopted it and all the best society of paris soon exhibited the indecency on their feet the king forbade their use by royal edicts and a special bull was fulminated against them by pope urban v but the monstrous shoes held their ground against both and were only disused when fashion set in a different direction Direction. the braguette was another enormity of the same character originally it is said the working classes invented the idea of a small bag hanging between the knees in which a knife or other utensil could be carried the fashion was adopted about the beginning of the fifteenth century by men of rank and became immediately of an immodest nature all the arts of fashion were called into requisition to give the braguettes the most novel and remarkable appearance and every possible means was used to render them at once disgustingly indecent and extravagantly rich they were attached to the dress with gay-coloured ribbons and when the wearer was a rich man were adorned with jewels and lace at the time montaigne wrote braguettes had almost gone out of vogue they were worn only by old men who in the language of their essayist make public parade of what cannot decently be mentioned women on their side invented hoops bustles and low-necked dresses the libraries contain a large collection of works written by moralists and preachers of the time against these indecent abuses of the ladies as they are all in use at the present time we may perhaps conclude that the old french moralists were unnecessarily alarmed but it is likely that the form of the bustle was by no means as modest as that of modern crinoline skirts and that the fashion of ladies drawers had not yet come in such at least is the inference from some of the criticisms they provoked the exposure of the breasts was checked for a time under louis the fourteenth but the reform was evanescent and the custom against which churchmen thundered in the sixteenth century survives to-day some allusion has already been made to the theatre theatricals were forbidden by the early french kings at the instigation of the church but the prohibition was evaded by the performance of scenes from the gospel dramatized from the remains of these moralities it would appear that they were always coarse and often immoral the devil always played a prominent part and would have been inconsistent had he not outraged decency under henry the third women began to appear on the stage and farces very broad in ideas and language began to be played instead of the old moralities we are led to believe that nothing was too scandalous to be represented on the stage in fact the idea seems to have been to crowd as much sensuality and vice into the farces as possible scarcely any incident of life was too indecent to be either portrayed or described and if the latter the description was given in the most undisguised language it is altogether impossible to transcribe scenes of this nature enough to say that women were made to go through the pains of childbirth on the stage husband and wife went to bed in the presence of the public and when modesty prompted the retirement of actors for causes still more indecent a colleague rarely failed to explain why they had retired and what they were doing behind the curtain many of la fontaine's most grivois stories were taken from farces which were once acted with copious pantomime before the ladies of paris even as late as the reign of henry the fourth plays of this character were commonly acted at paris in the hotel de bourgogne it was usual for the star actor to speak a prologue or an interlude which was invariably recommended by its indecency we have some of the titles of these prologues and they were generally of the same 
same character as the one on the question uter vir an mulier se magis delectet in copulatione of the number of regular prostitutes exercising their calling in france during the fifteenth and sixteenth centuries no correct estimate can be made it was undoubtedly large during the religious wars a writer on the side of protestantism undertook to draw up a statement of the number of prostitutes and lewd women whose vices were chargeable to the clergy his estimate is of course open to suspicion as being a sectarian performance but allowing for great exaggeration it will still appear alarming he calculates that there were at that time one million of women more or less who led habitually lewd lives and ministered to the passions of the clergy these were independent of the married women who were led into adultery and of the pimps and procuresses who were in clerical pay to return to the laws regulating prostitution it appears that a serious effort was made to put it down under the sovereignty of catherine of medicis an ordinance of charles the ninth dated fifteen sixty prohibited the opening or keeping of any brothel or house of reception for prostitutes in paris for a short period it seems that the practice was actually suppressed and the consequence is said to have been a large increase of secret debauchery a few years after the passage of the ordinance a huguenot clergyman named caille proposed to re-establish public brothels in the interest of the public morals but the authorities of his church assailed him so vehemently that his scheme fell to the ground without having had the benefit of a public discussion and he was himself driven to join in the romanists in fifteen eighty eight an ordinance of henry the third reaffirmed the ordinance of fifteen sixty and alleged that the magistrates of the city had connived at the establishment of brothels ordinances of the provost followed in the same strain and all prostitutes were required to leave paris within twenty-four hours an ordinance dated sixteen thirty five was still more rigorous it condemned all men concerned in the traffic of prostitution to the galleys for life and all women and girls to be whipped shaved and banished for life without any formal trial as might be imagined this ordinance was alternately disregarded and made to serve the purposes of private malice men who wished to revenge themselves on their mistresses accused them of being prostitutes but it does not appear that the actual supply was ever seriously diminished End of section nine Chapter 8 of the History of Prostitution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cynthia Sheeler. The History of Prostitution by William Sanger. Chapter 8 France history from louis the thirteenth to the present day exile of prostitutes measures of louis the fourteenth laws of sixteen eighty four and seventeen thirteen police regulations ordinance of seventeen seventy eight republican legislation frightful state of paris efforts to pass a general law the court louis the thirteenth the medicis louis the fourteenth la valliere montespan maintenon literature of the day feudal rights the regency duchess of berry claudine du Tencin louis the fifteenth madame de pompadour dubarry pere aux serfs louis the sixteenth philippe egalite subsequent sovereigns literature lewd novels and pictures tendency of philosophy the church we have thus sketched the history of prostitution in france 
from the commencement of the French nation to the reign of Louis XIII. This chapter will complete the subject to the present day. The Ordinance of 1560, prohibiting prostitution in any shape, and granting 24 hours only to prostitutes and their accomplices to evacuate Paris, remained in force till late in the 18th century. Though so far as the general traffic went, it was a dead letter. It enabled the police authorities to imprison or exile unruly prostitutes from time to time, and was the basis of the high-handed measure by which the colonists of Canada were first supplied with wives direct from the Paris stews. It also enabled noblemen and officials connected with government to avenge themselves upon unfaithful mistresses and to exercise a convenient sort of tyranny over the pretty lingeries and sewing girls of the metropolis. In 1684, Louis XIV made some alteration in the laws governing prostitution. He provided prisons for the detention of prostitutes and armed the lieutenant of police with authority to correct them. And he drew a broad line of distinction between dissolute women who were not actually upon the town and the class of prostitutes proper. A farther police regulation on the subject was made in 1713. By that measure, a sort of regularity was introduced into the procedure against courtesans and lewd women. They were definitely divided into two classes, women who led dissolute lives without being precisely prostitutes and prostitutes proper. The police were authorized to interfere against both on complaint of any person who charged them with outraging public decency. In the case of prostitutes, the proceeding was summary. The culprit was summoned, condemned on slight evidence, and sentenced either to exile, imprisonment, or more rarely to a whipping or the loss of her hair. With regard to dissolute women who were not regular prostitutes, the authorities proceeded more cautiously. They were entitled to all the privileges of other accused persons, sentences rendered against them being subject to appeal, and when found guilty, the penalty inflicted was usually a fine. Occasionally, the houses where they had carried on their calling were closed, the furniture was thrown out of the window, and a crier proclaimed their disgrace throughout the city. Monsieur Parent du Chalet, who had the patience to read all the records of proceedings against prostitutes in the city of Paris from 1724 to 1788, infers the law from these instances of its application and concludes, one, that notwithstanding the ordinance of 1560, brothels were licensed by the police. Two, that prostitutes were never troubled except on complaint of a responsible person. Three, that brothels were disorderly, that riots, rows, and murders not unfrequently occurred within their walls or in their neighborhood. Four, that the punishment was left to the discretion of the magistrate, that the penalties inflicted were lighter toward the close of the period examined. Six, that certain streets in Paris were wholly occupied by prostitutes. Probably with a view to enlarge the discretion of the magistrates, a new ordinance was passed in 1778, renewing in peremptory language the prohibitive provisions of the enactment of 1560. This ordinance, which bears the name and probably emanated from the office of Lenore, the police magistrate, declares that no public woman shall hereafter try to catch, recroacher, men on the wharves or boulevards, or in the streets or squares of Paris, under penalty of being shaved, whipped, and imprisoned, that no householder shall let his house or any part thereof 
to prostitutes under penalty of 500 francs fine and that boarding house keepers shall allow no men and women to sleep together without seeing their marriage contract the most curious feature in connection with this ordinance was the fact that it was not intended or held to interfere with established brothels which the government continued to license as before it was intended to affect private prostitutes only we may judge of its success from the general statement that soon after its passage the streets and squares were thronged with prostitutes no woman or modest person could walk the garden of the tuileries at night lewd women showed themselves at their windows in a state of nudity and shocked public decency still more glaringly by their postures in the streets it was in fact so complete a failure that two years after its establishment it was practically repealed by a new police regulation in seventeen ninety one the whole body of the legislation of the monarchy was abolished and in its stead the republican legislature enacted a code which was the only law in force in france that code making no reference to prostitution it was inferred by lawyers that women had a natural right to prostitute their bodies if they chose and accordingly the traffic became open and free the consequence of this was a tremendous development of the vice prostitutes established themselves in every street and monopolized every public place paris became scarcely habitable for modest women an outcry against this monstrous state of things reached the executive directory in 1796 and that body sent a message to the council of 500 begging them to legislate on the subject the message was clear and able calling upon the council to define prostitute and suggesting that reiterated offenses legally proved public notoriety or arrest in the act appeared to constitute proof of prostitution it seemed to call for penalties in the shape of imprisonment on women exercising this calling but neither the suggestion nor a subsequent project of the same character was ever carried into effect napoleon swept the palais royal of the prostitutes who had made it their headquarters and broke up some of the greatest brothels by harassing their inmates in various ways but he made no law on the subject in eighteen eleven m pasquier prefect of police drafted a bill for the regulation of prostitutes but it never went into effect and the imperial ordinance drawn by the prefect has been lost five years later m anglise prefect of police under louis the eighteenth attempted the same thing with no better success the law officers of the crown seeming to have supposed that the general provisions of the articles of the code on public decency and outrages upon public morality covered the particular case of prostitution the last efforts that were made in france to obtain a law for the regulation of prostitution in 1819 and 1822 when the ministry seriously thought of settling the whole matter by a royal declaration these endeavors had the same fate as the former ones leading to no result a general impression has prevailed of late years that the moral sense of the public would be shocked by any legislative act licensing so great a sin as prostitution and as the government has assumed without constitutional warrant the control and regulation of prostitutes and has exercised as full authority as it could have done had there been a law on the subject the deficiency has hardly been felt a conscientious official has occasionally experienced qualms of conscience at acting without legal warrant the government has sometimes been frightened by a menace of resistance from some bold lawyer but no trouble has ever actually arisen 
and custom now gives to the police regulations the force of law. We shall review these regulations in another place. Meanwhile, a glance must be cast upon the progress of morality in France during the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries. The gallantry which distinguished the court of Henry IV became more refined, though not less criminal under Louis XIII. Adultery and seduction were everyday matters in the circles which educated Mary, Queen of Scots, and developed the wit of the author of Grammont's memoirs. Every lady was presumed to have a lover, every man of fashion more than one mistress. Rich Lou boasted that no lady could reject him when he chose to throw the handkerchief, and Marzarin was accused of intrigues with the queen herself. Louis did not blush to visit his mistresses at the head of his guards, and in all the pomp of royalty, and as an instance of their influence over him, it has been stated that it was the request of Mademoiselle de Lafayette that he consented to visit his wife nine months before the birth of Louis the Fourteenth. A race of women had sprung up under the teaching of Medicis, who combined political skill with licentious propensities and conducted state and armorous intrigues with equal ardor and success. The ladies who surrounded Anne of Austria and Mary of Medicis and the brilliant circle which has been described in the memoirs of Madame de Longueville and Madame de Sablé were undoubtedly as dissipated as they were refined. Their virtues were in inverse proportion to their wit. Paris no longer witnessed the Louvre converted into a royal preserve or detestable debaucheries haunting its dark passages, but there reigned throughout the court an air of polished sensuality, which, in point of fact, must have been at least equally prejudicial to good morals. Louis the Fourteenth imbibed the spirit of the age during his minority. Royal mistresses had become a recognized institution, fathers and husbands rather courting than dreading dishonor at the hands of the king. After having dispensed his favors with some impartiality among the ladies of the court, he discovered, apparently to his surprise, that one of them, a charming girl named Louise de la Valliere, really loved him. The only person who showed much annoyance at the warmth with which the king entered upon this new liaison was the Duchess of Orleans, Henrietta of England, the king's sister-in-law, who seems to have expected that she would be the fortunate recipient of whatever crumbs might fall from the royal table. She was unable, however, to divert Louis from his purpose. La Valliere became his mistress and bore him two children. When he grew tired of her, as he did soon after the birth of her second child, she retired into a convent, and expiated her fault by thirty years' austere penitence. The king then turned his attention to a lady of noble rank, the wife of Marquis of Montespan, and in a business manner exiled the Marquis to his estate, and lived with his wife. A woman otherwise virtuous, proud and queenly, she lived with the king for fourteen years, and bore him eight children. These children were openly legitimated by Louis, and were married by him to members of the royal family. He even contemplated securing the throne to them, though they were thus doubly adulterine. The last mistress of Louis the Fourteenth was the famous Madame de Maintenon, the widow of the poet Scarron a person of remarkable abilities, and old enough to have recovered from the passions which were said to have disturbed her youth. She was introduced to the king as the governess of his illegitimate children, and by her arts contrived not only to wean the king's heart from his mistress, but even to alienate the children from their mother. For thirty-five years she wielded supreme control over Louis's mind, and whatever may be said of her early life, and however harsh a judgment must be formed of her political measures, it must be allowed that, in general, her influence was exercised for the good of religion and morality. 
under the direction of the court became positively devout intrigues were concealed not ostentatiously paraded before the public eye and the ladies by whom she was surrounded were obliged to lead at least outwardly decorous lives she might not be able to check the monstrous practices of the duke of orleans but much of the looseness of the court she could and really did bring to an end her royal lover who at first piqued himself upon rising as far above obligations of fidelity to his mistresses as he considered himself superior to political obligations to his people resigned himself to the spiritual direction of the marquise and allowed old age to assert its rights in condemning him to virtue all things considered the last twenty years of louis the fourteenth's reign was perhaps the most moral in the whole history of the monarchy this is well illustrated in the history of the literature of the day the leading philosophers writers and poets of the age of louis the fourteenth forbore to shock decency and may be read to-day as safely as any modern work preachers Bousset, Massillon, bordeloux exercised a potent influence over the tone of letters and society corneille racine and their contemporaries provided the stage with a repertory that could never bring a blush to the cheek even moliere who did occasionally let slip a joke of questionable propriety for the pit's sake seems a daring innovator when he is contrasted with his predecessors decency is in fact one of the most striking characteristics of the literature of the age we may also date from the reign of louis the fourteenth the final extinction of many of the old feudal rights which were at war with morality horrible as it may seem there were parts of france where the custom allowed the seigneur to debauch daughter of his vassal without obstacle or penalty in some provinces it is said to have been customary for the seigneur to enjoy the first night of every girl married within his manor in others the peculiar authority of the seigneur over the serfs who were attached to the glebe was held to endow him with the right of using the bodies of their wives and daughters as he saw fit no written custom justified these monstrous privileges but frequent allusions to them in old french writers show that in certain parts they were sanctioned by usage louis the fourteenth made it his especial business to break down the privileges of the nobility and it was no doubt to the general police regulations he made for the government of the kingdom at large and the extinction of these rights was mainly due with the regency the scene changes the duke of orleans had long been one of the most depraved men in france so long as louis the fourteenth lived he had perforce observed a certain outward decorum but the death of the monarch and the duke's high-handed seizure of the regency enabled him to give free scope to his propensities he resided in the palais royal and gave suppers there almost every evening to a select circle of ruse and fast women among whom madame du parabere long held the place of honor the company not unfrequently varied the entertainment by the performance of charades and tableaux among which the judgment of paris was a favorite of the regent the conversation of the guests was so gross as to shock all but the initiated and when they separated they were generally all intoxicated the most startling and horrible feature of these entertainments was the fact that the regent's daughter the duchess of berry was almost always present her life was a romance married while a child to the du de berry by her passionate temper and her levities she was the bane of her husband's life she embraced the infidel and licentious doctrines of the age in company with her father and the pair were so fond of each other that the most horrible suspicions began to gain ground they were dispelled for a time by the discovery of an intrigue between the duchess and her chamberlain which so provoked the duke that he seized his wife by the hair and beat her on his death which occurred soon afterward she gave the reins to her passion and set an example of scandal 
At the Luxembourg, where she had apartments, she exhibited the state of a queen, and lover succeeded lover with startling rapidity. At last, she seems to have fallen in love with an officer of her guards named Riom, whose only merit was youth. He subdued her. She became as docile and submissive to him as she had been intractable and haughty with her former lovers, and all Paris was talking of the transformation. After about a year of this liaison, she gave birth to a child. During the pains of childbirth, she was not expected to live, and the curate of St. Sulpice was sent in all haste to administer the extreme unction. The ecclesiastic happened to be a rigid champion of morality, and he refused to administer the rite, till Riam had been dismissed from the Luxembourg. The duchess would not consent to part with her lover, and for many hours this strange conflict went on by the bedside of the failing woman. The curate was obstinate, however, and no sacrament was administered. But the duchess, recovering, the regent used his authority and sent Riam to join his regiment. It killed his daughter. She invited her father to sup with her and used all her eloquence to persuade him to let her marry Riam. But the regent, remaining firm, she withdrew to her chamber, took to her bed, and died two days afterward. In alluding to the regent's mistresses, a word should be said of the famous Claudine Tutensen, whose adventures shed a flood of light on the morals of the day. She was a pretty girl of respectable, if not noble, family, living in a distant province. To escape from a marriage that was forced on her, she took refuge in a convent. Instead, however, of suiting her habits to her place of residence, she contrived to alter the mode of life at the convent so as to meet her desires, and it became famous for the gaiety of its social entertainments and the liveliness of its inmates. One of the gentlemen who were allowed to share his hospitality was the poet de Touches. He was smitten with the pretty Claudine, who acknowledged the charm of his accomplishments, and, after a few months' intimacy, gave birth to a male child who became the mathematician and philosopher de Lambert. Claudine had a brother, an abbey, a man of considerable cunning and no principle whatever. He persuaded his sister to go to Paris and seek her fortune. He obtained an introduction for her to the regent, and Claudine contrived to produce such an impression that she was soon installed as titular mistress. This did not last long, however. One day, venturing to remonstrate with the regent on his loose mode of life, his habitual drunkenness, etc., her lover lost patience with her, and suddenly summoned a crowd of his courtiers from the antechamber to witness the de Chablis and listen to the sermons of Madame. In revenge, Claudine rushed out and became the mistress of the Prime Minister, Cardinal de Bois. Her brother, the Abbey, got a bishopric for his share in the transaction. At the death of de Bois, Madame du Tencin gave him a successor, the Duke of Richelieu, the most famous lady-killer of the court. But she was growing old, and ambition had more attractions for her than love. She became an authoress, wrote religious works and novels, patronized letters, and brought out Montesquieu's spirit of laws. Her salons became the most fashionable in Paris. It was not a little singular that she should have been the head of one literary clique and her son, de Lambert, the chief of another, neither positively jealous of the other, yet living on terms of cold reserve. Louis the Fifteenth trod in the steps of his great-grandfather and the regent. His armors attracted no attention, being evanescent and trifling, till he quarreled with the queen and bestowed the title of mistress on the Countess of Maley. This lady had four sisters, three of whom had reached womanhood. They were jealous of their sister's success and solicited a share of the royal favor. The monarch graciously granted their prayer and admitted all four into an associate liaison. He was much hurt when the fifth, at the age of sixteen, declined an in interest 
in this delectable partnership. Falling ill soon afterward, he allowed his confessor to frighten him into parting with the sisters, and when he got well, replaced them by the wife of the sub-farmer of the finances, Madame de Lenormand de Toiles. He created her Marquis de Pompadour, and compelled the court to recognize her. Happily for him, she was a person of moderate taste and habits. She patronized letters, was the friend of Voltaire, and seems to have employed her influence over the king for his advantage and that of the public. It is recorded, as an instance of the heartlessness of the king, that when she died, he stood at a window to watch her funeral pass, and noticing that it was a rainy day, observed with a smile that the Marquis had bad weather for her long journey. Her successor was Madame Dubarry, a common prostitute fished out of the Paris stews in consequence of her skill in debauchery. Her real name was Van Bernier, but in order to present her at court, a nobleman of the name of Dubarry was persuaded to marry her. It was under her reign that the Parco Serfs, in which Madame de Pompadour was said to have had a hand, reached its highest point of celebrity and eclat. This was a royal seraglio filled with the most beautiful girls that could be bought or stolen. The monstrous old debauchee, who filled the throne of France, had a weakness for very young girls, fifteen being the age at which he preferred his mistresses. Under the skillful direction of Dubarry, a host of pimps and purveyors searched France for young girls to suit the king's fancy. Where negotiations could not be effected, the prerogative was stretched, and the police authorities judiciously blinded. But we are led to believe that it was seldom necessary to resort to these violent measures, and the French fathers of that day seldom made difficulties except about the sum to be paid. That the king was liberal may be inferred from the sum which his seraglio cost him, not less than one hundred millions of francs. It was a large, handsomely furnished building at Versailles, giving every woman her separate apartments. The king rarely visited each one more than three or four times, but on the occasion of his first visit, he prided himself on observing the etiquette of a husband. He insisted on the poor child whom he was about to ruin, kneeling down by the bedside, and saying her prayers in his presence. It need hardly be observed that the Parco Serfs was the great reservoir from whence the brothels of the time derived their supply of recruits. After a residence of a few weeks or months, in case they became pregnant, the poor children were thrown out upon the world, and ruin was a necessity. The last monarch of the old French line, the unfortunate Louis the Sixteenth, forms a bright contrast to his predecessors. His education had been severe. His principles were naturally strict. Placed upon the throne after the revolution had become inevitable, his whole attention was devoted to the business of reigning and attempting reforms which came quite too late. Neither he nor his wife ever gave rise to merited scandal. The profligate character of the court was, however, sustained by the Orleans family and their connections. Philippe Agalite was a true descendant of the regent. On the very eve of the revolution, he indulged in orgies that were closely initiated from those of the Palais Royal. Our sketch of the immoralities of the French court naturally ends here. Though the period of the Directory was marked by a general looseness in the best French society, both Napoleon and Louis the Eighteenth set no example of conjugal fidelity to their subjects, yet vice was not exhibited so openly under them as it had been under former kings and the laws of decency were not actually set at defiance. Their frailties were private matters, into which it is scarcely the duty of the historian to intrude. The same may be said of Charles X and Louis Philippe. The former had, in his youth, been a sharer of many of the excesses of the Orleans family, but at the time he became king he was an old man and could afford to lead a decent life. 
Louis Philippe had never afforded a theme for scandal. And as king, he set an example of rigorous morality. If we turn back now to the period of the Regency, we shall find letters sympathizing in the most marked manner with the court. Under the regime of severe etiquette and decency established by Louis the Fourteenth, authors respected the ear of innocence. Under the brutal sway of the regent and the lewd influence of the satyr Louis the Fifteenth, the old prostitution of literature was revived. Thus, we find that the most successful authors of the day, such as Voltaire, handled themes grossly immoral in themselves and rendered still more offensive by their mode of treatment. The most popular novel of the 18th century, Manon Lescant, the work, by the way, of an abbey, is the narrative of the adventures of a prostitute. Of all the romance writers of that age, no one was more widely popular or more generally read than Crebillion Phils, whose work would almost fall into the hands of the police at the present time. Diderot, Mirabeau, Montesquieu, and, with a few exceptions, all the most eminent men of France, prostituted their genius to the composition of erotic works which were widely read by women as well as men. Of the light poetry of the 18th century, very little is fit for modern reading, the poets being, as a general rule, either dull or depraved. Nor were the arts behindhand. Frescoes differing but little from those which had adorned Fontainebleau under Francis I again covered the walls of rich men's houses. And the most fortunate painters of the day were those who could best outrage decency without positively suggesting the brothel. Lewd books and pictures were freely sold in Paris during the Regency, the reign of Louis XV, and the Revolutionary Period. Napoleon burned all he could find, but there still remained enough to supply the demand almost ever since. It should be noticed in connection with the state of morals in France during the second half of the 18th century that the tendency of the philosophical doctrines, which were then current, was to undermine the respect paid to marriage and chastity. The former being a sacrament, was assailed as part of the ecclesiastical system. The latter was conceived to be at war with the natural and therefore the proper passions of mankind. Several of the philosophers left it to be inferred from their writings, or stated broadly, that the promiscuous intercourse, or at all events, unlimited facilities of divorce, were the natural destiny of the human race and that the restrictions which have been imposed on sensual gratification had no warrant in reason or sound ethics. These foolish notions brought forth fruits after their kind. Under the directory, prostitutes were received into certain societies, and ladies of fashion became prostitutes. Even under the empire, it was not unusual for a lady to request her husband to pay her a visit, as it was, well, perhaps to avoid questions of legitimacy arising at any future period. There was one branch of society in which morality had made great progress during the century. That was the church. It still contained cardinals like Dubois and bishops and abbeys like Du Tinsin, but the vast body of the country clergy led pure moral lives. This point is placed beyond a doubt by the silence of the parties opposed to the hierarchy when the revolution broke out, and they were so disposed to assail the priesthood on every vulnerable point. It may be broadly stated that the vices, which had infected the whole body of the clergy during the 16th century, had disappeared by the 18th. Despite the law of celibacy, the country curates were, as a rule, Moral, austere, virtuous men. End of chapter 8. Recording by Cynthia Sheeler. Website Cynthia Sheeler at iCanVoice.com.
Section 11 of The History of Prostitution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. The History of Prostitution by William Sanger. Section 11. Chapter 9. France. Syphilis. It properly belongs to this chapter to allude to the rise and progress of the diseases termed syphilitic, whether they were of ancient date, whether the shameful diseases which have been mentioned in the chapter devoted to prostitution at Rome were the same as the modern syphilis, may be decided by the reader. It will suffice here to say that, throughout the Middle Ages, a species of disease termed sometimes leprosy, sometimes purandagra, appears to have prevailed in France as in other European countries, and to have chosen for its chief seat the organs of generation. It was not, however, till the close of the fifteenth century that public attention began to be generally directed to the subject of sexual disease. We shall briefly enumerate the earliest notices of its appearance. When Charles the Eighth entered Naples in 1595, he found the city suffering from a plague, syphilis, to which the prejudice of the natives gave the name of French malady. Italy, said the writers of the day, was attacked simultaneously by the French army and this new disease. Most of the Italian writers accused the French of its introduction. Benevenis, however, says they got it from the Spaniards, and G. Giardini candidly admits that his countrymen were the real propagators of the malady. German physicians likewise traced its origin to Naples and placed it about the year 1593 ascribing it to an untoward planetary conjunction. The disease appeared at Barcelona in 1493, and in other parts of Spain in the following year. But sixty years before, in 1430, public regulations had been made in London to prevent the admission of persons attacked with a disease very similar to syphilis into houses of prostitution, and requiring the police to keep constant watch over such as should show symptoms of this infirmitas nefanda. The first authentic allusion to the disease in France is the ordinance of the Parliament of Paris, dated 1497, ordering all persons attacked by the large pox to vacate the city within twenty-four hours, and not to return till they were cured, providing a sort of hospital for those who cannot move, and appointing agents to bestow four sols parises on the exiles to pay for their journey. This ordinance alludes to the disease having been prevalent for two years. It may therefore be taken for granted that, whether syphilitic diseases had existed before or not, they prevailed to a very alarming extent throughout Europe at the close of the fifteenth century. To prevent misconception, it may be as well to give the diagnostic signs of the French malady as furnished by Fracastor. Quote, the patients were in low spirits and broken down. Their faces were pale. Most of them had chancres upon their organs of generation. These chancres were obstinate. When cured in one place, they reappeared in another, and the work was never ended. Pustules with a hard surface appeared upon the skin, generally on the head first. On first appearing they were small, but gradually increased to the size of an acorn, which they resembled in shape. In some cases they were dry, in others humid, some were livid, others white and pale, others again hard and reddish. They burst after a few days, and discharged an incredible quantity of vile fetid humour. When they began to separate, they became true phagodinic ulcers, consuming both flesh and bone. When they attacked the upper part of the body, they gave rise to malign fluxions, which gnawed away the palate, or the windpipe, or the throat, or the tonsils. Some patients lost their lips, others the nose, others the eyes, others the whole organs of generation. Many were troubled with moist tumours on the limbs, which grew as large as eggs or small loaves. When they burst, a white and mucilaginous liquor exuded from them. They were usually found on the legs and arms. Some were ulcerated, others again remained callous to the last. And, as if this was not enough, the patients suffered terrible pains, especially at night, not only in the articulations, but in the limbs and nerves. Some sufferers, however, had pustules without pains, others pains without pustules. 
but in most cases both occurred together. The patients were languid, had no appetite, desired to remain constantly in bed. The face and legs swelled. Some had a slight fever, but this was rare. Others had severe headaches for which no remedy could be found. End quote. At first, it seems, the faculty, strangely misapprehending its duties, refused to treat patients assailed by this new plague. As at Rome, they were left to the tender mercies of quacks, barbers, and old women. About the beginning of the sixteenth century, however, the extent of the mischief provoked sympathy from the physicians, and one or two treatises appeared on the subject. Sudorifics seem to have been the chief agent employed. Large use was made of holy wood, the wood of the lignum vitae tree, which was imported from America for the purpose. It was doses of holy wood in decoction which are said to have saved the life of the great Erasmus. After the passage of the law of 1497, a house in the Faubourg Saint-Germain was appropriated to the reception of the victims of syphilis, but there is no reason to believe that any attempt was made to treat them there. They were left to die, or to quack themselves. Eighteen years after, in 1505, the house in question, being too small for the numbers of the sick, and it being clearly shown that syphilis was not contagious except by sexual intercourse or positive peculiar contact with the person afflicted, a new decree of Parliament appropriated funds for the construction of quote, a hospital for persons attacked by the large pox, les grands verrouillés, end quote, and directed that they should be properly cared for. This decree was never carried into effect. Thirty years afterward, the condition of the sick was far worse than it had ever been, they being left to die in the streets. A new decree, in 1535, appointed commissioners to choose a locality for a hospital, and, notwithstanding some opposition from the religious authorities, they performed their task. A small hospital was appropriated to syphilitic patients and persons suffering from itch, epilepsy, and St. Vitus's dance. It was soon filled, and several patients were thrust into the same bed. Owing to mismanagement on the part of the directors, it was short of linen, lint, and medicine. The Parliament interfered, but without success, and, in despair, the unfortunate sufferers contrived to effect an entrance into the Hospital General, the Hotel Dieu. They were soon admitted on the same terms as other sufferers, but, as the establishment was far too small to accommodate all who sought refuge there, they were thrust four and five together into the same bed, and persons with syphilitic diseases lay by the side of men in contagious fevers, and others with broken legs and arms. The Parliament interfered a second time. The municipal officers of Paris were assembled, and called upon to provide a hospital for venereal cases, but for many years the strenuous opposition of the Hotel Dieu neutralized all the efforts that were made. It was not till 1614 that the project of the Parliament was realized and a syphilitic hospital actually opened. Up to this time, that is to say, for a period of a century and a quarter, persons attacked by venereal disease were left to the care of Providence. Males could, with some exertion, occasionally obtain admission to the Hotel Dieu, where they often contracted new diseases without getting rid of the old, but of females not a word had yet been spoken. No one in that hundred and twenty-five years had ever raised a voice to plead on behalf of the prostitutes. It never seems to have occurred, even to the Parliament which had so much sympathy for the pauvre Vérolet, that the women likewise deserved pity and attention. We possess no information with regard to the treatment used in this new hospital. It is certain, however, that, in obedience to the law of its foundation, patients were soundly whipped when they entered and when they left it, by way of punishing them for having contracted the disease. In 1675, the managers of the hospital declared that this practice deterred many sick persons from coming forward and confessing their condition, but it prevailed, apparently, for a quarter of a century afterward. About the middle of the 17th century, under the reign of Louis XIV, a hospital prison, named the Salpetriere, was established for the reception of prostitutes, but, by a strange inconsistency, in 1658 it was closed to women suffering from syphilis, femme gâtée, and physicians were directed to examine all women, quote, who showed symptoms of syphilis on the face, end quote. 
a few years' experience showed the fallacy of this system. Diseased women were confined in the place should they not be treated there. The physicians thought they should, and accordingly, though in violation of the rules of the establishment, a small room was appropriated to this class of patients. It appears that at this time a prostitute found some difficulty in obtaining admission to the Salpetriere, it being not unusual for unfortunate creatures to have themselves arrested for vagabondage, and to submit voluntarily to the whipping which the ethics of the day required in the case of females as well as males, in order to obtain medical treatment. It will be seen that our New York system cannot claim the merit of originality. Prostitutes, in fact, flock to the Salpetriere in such numbers that the room furnished by the connivance of the authorities was soon far too small to accommodate them. The hospital managers declared to the royal government that medical treatment was out of the question in so crowded an apartment, and that a putrid fever might be expected if better accommodations were not provided. In reply, the government placed at their disposal a ward in the hospital of Bicetre, this was in 1691. For nearly a hundred years afterward, the severe cases of venereal disease were sent to Bicetre, the milder ones kept at Salpetriere. Both establishments were a disgrace to humanity. The patients were cheated of the food allowed them, and supplied with cheap broth and cheese in its stead. No baths, and but few medicines, were at their command. Their ward was filthy, close, and in ruin patients were often obliged to wait so long for medical attendance that their maladies became incurable. The air in which they lived was pestiferous, and no one could visit the hospital without being shocked at its aspect. Medical men who saw the place expressed amazement that so many persons should exist in so small a room. Eight women slept in a bed, and in the room appropriated to those whose turn for treatment had not come, the patients slept by gangs, one half sleeping from 8 p.m. to 1 a.m., and the remainder from 1 a.m. to 7 a.m. The floor was covered with dirt and filth, and the windows were nailed down, for fear of their being broken if opened. There was but little linen, and that was in rags, and abominably dirty. One hundred persons only were treated at a time, fifty men and fifty women. A new batch was admitted to treatment every two months, and, as the hospital always contained from three to four hundred sufferers, some cases remained six or eight months without any treatment whatever. Many died before they reached the hands of the doctors. The diet was the same for all. Those who had not been admitted to treatment were supplied with coarse bread, cheese, rancid butter, and, very seldom, a little meat. The surgeons of Bicetre usually made fortunes in a short time. If anything farther were needed to characterize the hospital of Bicetre in the eighteenth century, it would be the rules in virtue of which no diseased person could claim admission until a complete year had elapsed from the time of their first application, and every diseased person was turned out, whether ill or well, after six weeks' treatment. It was stated to M. Parent du Châtelet that the average mortality was one hundred women and sixty men per annum. In 1787, Dr. Collier was appointed surgeon in charge of syphilitic cases at Bicetre. He commenced his administration by denouncing the state of things he found there, and it is mainly from the memoirs he addressed to the government that the preceding facts have been obtained. His representations seem to have met with but little success. In 1789, however, the bulk of the prisoners at Bicetre were set free and he immediately availed himself of the increased room to accommodate his patients. The reform was so slight, or rather, so vast a reform was needed, that the moment the attention of the Republican government was drawn to the subject, it removed the syphilitic cases from the hospital of Bicetre to the hospital of the Capuchins. That establishment was enlarged, and named the Hospital of the South, L'Hôpital du Midi. Gardens and baths were provided, Ample wards permitted the classification of diseases. The food was of the best kind, and sufficient in quantity. This immense step was the work of the Republican authorities. It was, however, only the first of a series of reforms. Originally, men and women of all grades were admitted promiscuously. This led to grave inconveniences. 
the decorum of the hospital was frequently disturbed by the conduct of some of the men with regard to the prostitutes in the adjoining wards to obviate this a new hospital was set apart under the reign of charles x for the reception of male patients only it is the hôpital de lourcine a still more serious trouble arose from the mixture of prostitutes with other women who from the infidelity of their husbands hereditary disease or other causes found themselves infected with syphilis for some time complaints had been made on this head but an accident which occurred in eighteen twenty eight compelled the authorities to act the daughter of a professional nurse residing in the vicinity of paris caught syphilis from a child her mother was nursing who had inherited the disease it took the shape of a virulent chancre on the palate and the girl was sent to the hospital du midi for treatment she found herself thrust among the vilest prostitutes whose language and sentiments shocked her so terribly that she insisted on leaving the hospital at once the physician on duty declined to grant her request whereupon the poor girl contrived to get into the yard and threw herself into a well she was drowned and on an autopsy of her corpse it appeared that she was a virgin this dreadful incident aroused the public mind hitherto the disposal of the prostitutes had been a subject of dispute between the administration of the hospital and that of the city each wishing to thrust them upon the other the government now interfered and special accommodation was provided for prostitutes at the prison of saint lazare the hospital du midi was devoted exclusively to such women as were not inscribed on the rolls of the police before these distributions took place when men and women were indiscriminately received at the hospital du midi the average annual admissions from eighteen o four to eighteen fourteen were two thousand seven hundred from eighteen twenty two to eighteen twenty eight it exceeded an average of three thousand one hundred twenty years ago the mortality was said to be less than two per cent it was ten per cent at bicetre at the hospital du midi diseased persons who do not desire admission to the hospital are treated outside all the medicines they require being furnished them free of charge it would appear from stray allusions in various old ordinances that some sort of medical office had been established in the eighteenth century by the government for the purpose of affording gratuitous advice to prostitutes and denouncing those who were diseased but there exists no positive evidence of any such establishment or office it was not till eighteen o three that a regulation was made by the prefect of police requiring all public women to submit to be visited by a physician appointed by him the plan was a bad one as the physician was paid by fees which he was authorized to exact and it was rendered worse in practice by the dishonesty of the man chosen for the office one coulon this individual made money and neglected his duties the system was altered in eighteen ten and a dispensary established with a strong medical staff who were directed to visit all the prostitutes in paris this institution is still in existence it will be further noticed in the next chapter when the dispensary was established its medical officers were directed to offer the to prostitutes the choice of being treated at home or going to the hospital almost all chose the former the physicians then undertook to decide themselves which should go to the hospital and which remain in their houses the results of their experience and the policy it compelled them to adopt are shown in the following table which was compiled by parent du chatelet first column year second column number treated at home eighteen twelve two hundred and seventy six eighteen thirteen three hundred eighteen fourteen two hundred and ninety six eighteen fifteen no report eighteen sixteen no report eighteen seventeen one hundred and twenty three eighteen eighteen no report eighteen nineteen twenty five eighteen twenty nineteen eighteen twenty one twenty seven eighteen twenty four twenty seven eighteen twenty five seven eighteen twenty six four the system of treating prostitutes at home was in fact given up it was found they could not be compelled to take the medicines given them and that though labouring under the most severe disease they would not abstain from the exercise of their calling 
the tables prepared by the sanitary office or dispensary at Paris, afford a clear view of the extent and progress of the disease in that city. Of those which are furnished by M. Parent du Châtelet, we shall take a few of the most striking. The following gives the aggregate disease for a period of twenty years. First column is years, second column average patients, third column total patients. 1812, 51, total 612, 1813, average 79, total 948, 1814, average 102, total 1224, 1815, report missing, 1816, average 88, total 1056, 1817, average 76, total 912, 1818, average 68, total 816, 1819, average 58, total 696, 1820, average 62, total 744, 1821, average 55, total 660. 1822, report missing. 1823, average 69, total 828. 1824, average 84, total 1008. 1825, average 81, total 972. 1826, average 93, total 1,116. 1827, report missing. 1828, average 104, total 1,248. 1829, average 99, total 1,188. 1830, average 91, total 1,092, 1,831, average 110, total 1,320, 1,832, average 78, total 936, total over 20 years, 17,376, add approximate estimate for three years waiting, 3,250, total diseased in 20 years, 20,626. Other tables, apparently drawn with care, show that the proportion of disease to prostitutes varies widely in different years. In 1828, it was 6%, that is to say, 6 out of every 100 prostitutes were diseased, but in 1832 it was barely 3%. Four or five percent would seem a tolerably fair average. From another table compiled by the same author, we gather that, during a period of eighteen years, January was found the most fatal month for prostitutes. Next came August and September, while February, April, May, and July seemed seasons less favourable to disease. M. du Châtelet, however, candidly admits that he can trace the operation of no law here, and inclines to the belief that the variation is wholly due to chance. End of section 11。section 12 of the history of prostitution。this is a LibriVox recording。all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain。For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of Prostitution by William Sanger Section 12, Chapter 10 France, Present Regulations It remains to describe the state and system of prostitution at Paris at the present day. The vast importance of the subject will doubtless justify the length at which it must be treated. It was usual, during the last century, to estimate the number of prostitutes in Paris at twenty-five or thirty thousand. Even as late as 1810, the number was said by good authority to be not less than 18,000. The police rolls show that these calculations were wide of the mark. According to them, the average number of prostitutes inscribed had risen from about 1900 in 1814 
to 3,558 in 1832, the last year of which we have any record. Assuming that the number at present is 4,500 or thereabouts, which would suppose an increase equal to that noted before 1832, the prostitutes are one to every 250 of the total population. Of these, the city of Paris furnishes rather more than one-third. The remainder come from the departments, those bordering on Paris being the most fruitful of prostitutes, and the north being largely in excess of production over the south. The vast majority of these prostitutes are the children of operatives and mechanics. Of 828 fathers, there were 19 weavers, 12 peddlers, 28 masons and tilers, 11 water carriers, 35 stage and carriage drivers, 50 shoemakers, 31 farmers and gardeners, 23 servants, 18 individuals employed in foundries, etc., 113 day laborers, 31 carpenters, 22 liquor sellers, 23 smiths, 18 grocers and fruit sellers, 30 soldiers on pensions, 16 clockmakers and jewelers, 16 barbers and hairdressers, 64 persons without trade or calling, 22 tailors, 21 plasterers, pavers, etc., 11 coopers, 25 painters, glaziers, and printers, whereas there were only four surgeons, physicians, and lawyers, three teachers, and nine musicians. The inference drawn by M. Perrin du Châtelet from this, that brothels are supplied from the classes of domestics and factory girls, and that girls not bred to work rarely find their way into them. Rather, more than one-third of the fathers of these prostitutes were unable to sign their names. Of the prostitutes born at Paris, about one-fourth were illegitimate. Of those born in the departments, one-eighth were illegitimate. Rather, more than one-half the Paris prostitutes could not write their names, a degree of ignorance which argues very remarkable neglect on the part of parents. For at Paris, everyone must learn to write gratuitously, and a person who cannot write will always experience difficulty in obtaining employment. Nearly half the prostitutes were between the ages of 20 and 26 inclusive. One declared herself, or was proved to be, only 12 years old. 34 were over 50, two were over 60. On reference to the rules of inscription, it appeared that the bulk of the prostitutes registered themselves between the ages of 18 and 22. But 34 were inscribed before the age of 14, which may be assumed to be the period of puberty in France, and a few after passing 50. The following table shows the number of years during which the Paris prostitutes had exercised their calling at the time the inquiry was made. 439, at one year and under. 590, from one to two years. 440, from two to three years. 485, from three to four years. 294, from four to five years. 139, from five to six years. 150 from 6 to 7 years, 143 from 7 to 8 years, 96 from 8 to 9 years, 100 from 9 to 10 years, 109 from 10 to 11 years, 93 from 11 to 12 years, 99 from 12 to 13 years, 98 from 13 to 14 years, 107 from 14 to 15 years, 80 from 15 to 16 years, 19 from 16 to 17 years, 14 from 17 to 18 years, 17 from 18 to 19 years, 4 from 19 to 20 years, none from 20 to 21 years, 1 from 21 to 22 years, and none from 22 to 23 years. M. Du Châtelet made careful inquiries into the causes of prostitution. He admits that, the difficulty of obtaining trustworthy information on this head being very great, many errors may have found their way into his calculations. He gives them, however, for what they may be worth. For 1,441, the cause is want. For 1,255, expulsion from home or desertion of parents. For 37, the desire to support old and infirm parents. For 29, the desire to support younger brothers and sisters or nephews and nieces. For 23, widows with families to support. For 280, girls from the country to support themselves.
For 404, girls from the country, brought to Paris by soldiers, clerks, students, etc. For 289, servants seduced by masters and abandoned. For 1,425, concubines abandoned by their lovers. This leads to a total of 5,183. It appears that there were in Paris, in 1832, 220 tolerated houses, that is to say brothels. The rules regarding these are numerous. They cannot be established in certain localities, such as the boulevards, or other great thoroughfares. They must not be within 100 yards of a church, or within 50 or 60 yards of a school, whether for boys or girls, of a palace or other public building, or of a large boarding house. The proprietor of the house must have given his consent before the house can be used as a brothel. Two houses cannot be established side by side, much less can they have the same entry. As a general rule, a preference is given to small narrow streets, especially cul-de-sac, and to places where brothels have been established before. With regard to the interior of these houses, they must contain a room for each girl. On no account are two prostitutes allowed to occupy the same room, much less the same bed. Each room must, moreover, be amply provided with utensils, soap, and water for ablution. No house can have back or side doors, or in any way communicate with the adjoining buildings. No house can contain dark closets or dark passages, or concealed hiding places. In none of them can any trade or traffic be carried on. With regard to the class of houses, called Maison de Passe, the police authorities require that in every house, two regular prostitutes, inscribed on the police rolls, shall live permanently. The object of this rule is to obtain a control and supervision over these houses. Before it was adopted, the police was often embarrassed by denials of its authority to invade them. It is found that the prostitutes, being naturally hostile to the mistresses of the house, will act as agents of the police in the event of any scandalous proceedings. The windows of the houses of prostitution must be roughed, as also must be of the rooms where the individual prostitutes live. They can only be partially opened. These regulations were made in consequence of the shocking scenes that were witnessed at the windows of brothels after the Revolution naked women being the least of the scandals that used to be exposed. No one can keep a house of prostitution in Paris without an authorization from the police. Men are never permitted to keep establishments of the kind. A woman who desires to open a house must apply in writing to the prefect of police. On receipt of her application, reference is made to the commissary of police of the ward to ascertain her character. If she has been condemned for crime or misdemeanor, her request is rarely granted. If she stands in the police books as a woman requiring supervision, she cannot succeed. Nor can she obtain a license, under ordinary circumstances, unless she has been a prostitute herself. The reason of this regulation is obvious. No one but a prostitute understands the business thoroughly. And the position of brothel keeper is found to be the most demoralizing station in the world. It has been the policy of Paris police to throw impediments in the way of persons not wholly depraved, devoting themselves to so dangerous a calling. Furthermore. The applicant must have reached a certain age. She must also be of sober habits, and apparently possessed of sufficient force of character to be able to command a house full of prostitutes. She must possess a sum of money sufficient to guarantee her against immediate failure, and she must own the furniture in the house she wishes to keep. When all of these conditions are fulfilled, the applicant receives a passbook, in which the number of girls she is allowed to keep is specified. In this book, she is bound to enter the name of every prostitute she receives, whether as a boarder or a transient larger, her name, the date of her entry into the house, the date of her inspection by a physician, and the date of her departure from the house. A printed form in the beginning of the passbook reminds the mistress of the house that she is bound, under heavy penalties, to inscribe on the police rolls every girl she receives within 24 hours of her arrival. In the event of neglect of these rules by the keepers of houses of prostitution, the license is revoked. It is understood that the police enforce this regulation with due rigor. Much has been said and written about the manner in which keepers of houses of prostitution obtain recruits. M. Perrand du Châtelet, whose sources of information were the best, gives it as his opinion that most of the prostitutes are obtained from hospitals, especially the Hospital du Midi, where female venereal diseases are treated. It appears that this hospital and others are haunted by old women who have been prostitutes, and who, in their old age, eke out a living by enticing others into the same calling. They soon discover the disposition of every young girl they find in the hospitals, and if she be pretty or engaging, she must either have principal or careful friends to rescue her from the clutches of the old hags. 
While she lies ill on her bed of pain, the latter are constantly with her and gain her friendship. They know the devices that are needed to impose on her simplicity, and not unfrequently are enabled to strengthen the promises by small donations in money, or a weekly stipend during her convalescence. For a pretty girl as much as fifty francs will be paid by a brothel keeper. As the girls in France, with few exceptions, come to Paris to be cured when they have contracted disease from association with lovers, it is quite likely that, as M. Perron du Châtelet supposes, these hospitals are a fruitful source of prostitutes. Other brothel keepers have female agents in the country towns who send them girls. One well-known woman, who kept for many years one of her largest establishments in France, employed a traveling clerk with a large salary. Some obtain boarders from their own province or native city. Others, who have followed a trade, get recruits from the acquaintances they made at the workshop. Laterally, it would seem, pimps have carried on their trade with unusual boldness and success. Sometimes, since it was noticed that an uncommon number of girls arrived at Paris from Rheims, they all came provided with name and address of the house to which they were destined, and drove there from the stage office. Information was sent to the police authorities of Rheims, and on their arrival, the girls were sent back again. The design of the authorities was baffled for a while by the cunning of the pimps, who sent their recruits round by other roads, but the police finally triumphed by refusing, for a year or two, to inscribe any prostitutes from Rheims. It is notorious, however, that the same traffic is carried on at the present day to an alarming extent between London and Paris, London and Brussels, and other large cities in the neighborhood. Several societies have been formed, and the police have made great exertions to suppress the trade, but without any particular success. It is understood that the prostitutes of Paris receive nothing for their labors, but their board, lodging, and dress. The latter is often expensive. In first-class houses it will exceed five hundred francs, which in female attire will go as far at Paris as five hundred dollars will in New York. The whole of the fees exacted from visitors goes to the mistress, and the girls are reluctantly permitted to retain the presents they sometimes receive from their lovers. They are usually in debt to the mistress, who, having no other means of retaining them under her control, hastens to advance the money for jewelry, carriages, fine eating, and expensive wines. No written contract binds them to remain where they are. They may leave when they please, if they can pay their debts, and the obligation they incur for the latter is one of honor only, and cannot be enforced in the courts. Houses of prostitution, when well conducted, are very profitable in Paris. It is estimated that the net profits accruing from each girl ought to be ten francs or more per day. Many keepers of houses have retired with ten to twenty-five thousand francs a year, and married their daughters well. The goodwill of a popular house has been sold for sixty thousand francs, twelve thousand dollars. We now come to the great feature of the Paris system, the inscription of prostitutes in a department of the prefecture of police, called the Bureau des Morts. It seems that some sort of inscription was in use before the Revolution, but no law referring to it or records of the rules can be found. Various systems were employed during the Republic and the Empire. The one now in use was adopted in 1816 and amended by a police regulation of 1828. Prostitutes are inscribed either 1. on their own request, 2. on the requisition of the mistress of the house, or 3. on the report of the inspector of prostitutes. When a girl appears in front of the bureau for any of these circumstances, she is asked the following questions, the answers being taken down in writing. 1. Her name, age, birthplace, trade, and residence. 2. Whether she is a widow, wife, or spinster. 3. Whether her father and mother are living, and what their calling was or is. 4. Whether she lives with them, and if not, when and how she left them. 5. Whether she has had children, and where they are. 6. How long has she been in Paris? 7. Whether anyone has a right to claim her. 8. Whether she has ever been arrested, and if yes, how often, and for what offenses. 9. Whether she has ever been a prostitute before, and for what period of time. 10. Whether she has, or has had, venereal disease. 11. Whether she has received any education. 12 what her motive is in inscribing herself. The answers to these inquiries suggest others, which are put at the discretion of the officials. Their practice is so great that they are rarely deceived by the women. M. Perrin du Châtelet affirms that they could tell an old prostitute merely by the way she sat down. 
The interrogatory over, the girl is taken by an inspector to the dispensary and examined, and the physician on duty reports the result, which is added to the inquiry. Meanwhile, the police registers have been consulted, and if the girl has been an old offender, or is known to the police, she is now identified. If the girl has her baptismal certificate, extrait de naissance, with her, she is forthwith inscribed and registered among the public women of Paris. As prostitutes rarely possess this document, however, a provisional inscription is usually effected, and a direct application is made to the mayor of the city, or commune, where she was born for the certificate. This application varies according to the age of the girl. If she is of age, it simply is a demand for the extrait de naissance of blank, who says she is a native of your city or commune. If, on the contrary, she is a minor, the application states that a girl who calls herself blank, and says she was born at blank, has applied for inscription in this office. I desire you to ascertain the position of her family, and what means they propose to take in case they desire to secure the return of this young girl. It often happens that the family implore the intervention of the police. In that case, the girl is sent back to the place whence she came. In many cases, the family decline to interfere, and then the girl is duly inscribed on the register. She signs a document in which she states that, being duly acquainted with the sanitary regulations established by the Prefecture for Public Women, she declares that she will submit to them, will allow herself to be visited periodically by the physicians of the dispensary, and will conform in all respects to the rules in force. Of course, this procedure is occasionally delayed by falsehoods uttered by the woman. It often used to happen when the mayors would report that no person of the name given had been born at the time fixed in their city or commune. In that case, the girl was recalled and made to understand that truth was better policy than falsehood. Girls rarely held out for longer than a fortnight or so, and, at the present time, the number of false declarations is very small indeed. They seem satisfied that the police are an omniscient machine which cannot be deceived. When the girl is brought to the office, either by a brothel keeper or an inspector, the proceeding is slightly varied. In the latter case, she has been arrested for indulging in clandestine prostitution, but she almost invariably denies the fact and pleads her innocence. The rule, in this case, is to admonish her and let her go. It is not till the third or fourth offense has been committed that she is inscribed. When the mistress of a house brings a girl to the office, interrogatories similar to the above are put to her. If she has relations or friends at Paris, they are sent for and consulted. When the girl appears evidently lost, she is duly inscribed. But if she shows any signs of shame or contrition, she is often sent home by the office at the public expense. It need hardly be said that when a girl is found diseased, she is sent to the hospital and her inscription held over. It occasionally happens that virgins present themselves at the office and desire to be inscribed. In their case, the officials use compulsion to rescue them from infamy. In a word, the Paris system, with regard to inscriptions, is to inscribe no girl with regard to whom it is not manifest that she will carry on the calling of a prostitute, whether she be inscribed or not. From the following table, prepared by M. Perrin du Châtelet, from the records of a series of years, it appears that the mistresses of houses inscribe over one-third of the total prostitutes. 7,388 girls were inscribed at their own request. 4,436 girls were inscribed by mistresses of houses. 720 girls were inscribed by inspectors, for a total of 12,544 girls. The age at which girls can be inscribed has varied under different administrators. Under one, it was 17. Under his successor, 18. Under the next, 21 years. But now the general rule is that no girl should be inscribed under the age of 16. Exceptions to this rule are made in the case of younger girls, of 13, 14, or 15, who lead a life of prostitution and are frequently attacked by disease. From a regard to public health, they are inscribed notwithstanding their age. Only second in importance of the subject of inscription is that of radiation, the obliteration of an inscription. This is the process by which a prostitute takes leave of her calling, throws off the control of the police, and regains her civil rights. At Rome, as has been shown already, no such formality as radiation was known to the law. Once a prostitute, always a prostitute, was the Roman rule. This system did not long sustain the test of a Christian examination. The police of the French Bureau des Morts, on this head, is governed by two very simple maxims. First, the amendment of prostitutes ought to be encouraged as much as possible. Second, that no prostitute should be released from the supervision of the police and the visits of the dispensary physician until there is a reasonable ground for believing that her repentance and alteration of life are sincere and likely to be permanent. 
A person desiring to have her name struck from the rolls of public women must make a written application, specifying her reasons for desiring to change her mode of life, and indicating the means of support on which she is henceforth to rely. In three cases, the demand is granted forthwith. First, when the girl proves that she is about to marry. Second, when she produces the certificate of a physician that she is attacked by an organic disease which renders it impossible for her to continue the calling of prostitute. And third, when she has gone to live with her relations and produces evidence of her late good behavior. In all other cases, the office awards a provisional radiation for a period of time, which varies according to circumstance from three months to a year, the girl is still under the supervision of the police, such supervision being obviously secret and discreet. When the girl passes triumphantly through this period of probation, her name is definitely struck from the role of prostitutes. When a girl, after having her name struck out, desires to be inscribed afresh, her request is granted without delay or inquiry, it being wisely supposed that she has repented on her decisions. A reinscription also takes place when a girl, after radiation, is found in a house of prostitution, even as a servant. A prostitute is struck from the rules by authority of the office when she has disappeared and no trace of her has been found for three months. M. Perrin du Châtelet gives the following table of radiations, which, taken in connection with the table already given of the number of prostitutes registered, shows a movement of reform. In 1817, 485 women were struck off the rolls of prostitutes at their own request, 575 were struck off the rolls of prostitutes in consequence of absence, for a total of 1,060. In 1818, 477 were struck at their own request, 582 in consequence of absence, for a total of 1,059. In 1819, 469 were struck at their own requests, 571 were struck in consequence of absence, for a total of 1,040. In 1820, 415 were struck at their own request, 716 were struck in consequence of absence, for a total of 1,131. In 1821, 433 were struck at their own request, 733 were struck in consequence of absence, for a total of 1,166. In 1822, 417 were struck at their own request, 739 were struck in consequence of absence, for a total of 1,156. In 1823, 502 were struck at their own request, and 605 were struck in consequence of absence, for a total of 1,107. In 1824, 442 were struck at their own request, 602 were struck in consequence of absence, for a total of 1,044. In 1825, 456 were struck at their own request, 527 were struck in consequence of absence, for a total of 983. In 1826, 486 were struck at their own request, and 554 were struck in consequence of absence, for a total of 1,040. In 1827, 490 were struck at their own request, 542 were struck in consequence of absence, for a total of 1,032. In the year 1828, 572 were struck at their own request, 415 were struck in consequence of absence, for a total of 987. In 1829, 298 were struck at their own request, and 536 were struck in consequence of absence, for a total of 834. In 1830, 334 were struck at their own request, 502 were struck in consequence of absence, for a total of 836. In 1831, 284 were struck at their own request, 452 were struck in consequence of absence, for a total of 736. In 1832, 449 were struck at their own request, 718 were struck in consequence of absence, for a total of 1,167. In total, this means that 7,009 women were struck off the rolls of prostitutes at their own request, and 9,369 women were struck off the rolls of prostitutes in consequence of absence, for a total of 16,378 women struck off the rolls of prostitutes. Once described, prostitutes are divided into three classes. First, those who lived in a licensed or tolerated brothel. 
second, those who lived alone in furnished rooms, and third, those who lived in rooms which they furnish and outwardly bear no mark of infamy. In the eye of the law, there is no difference between the three classes. All are equally subject to police and medical supervision. Every girl that is inscribed receives a card bearing her name and the number of her page in the register. A blank column of this card is left to be filled out by a memorandum of date of each visit by the physicians of the dispensary. But the three classes differ in respect of the place where they are visited. The dispensary physicians visit the inmates of brothels in the houses where they live. All other prostitutes visit them at the dispensary. Yet another visit is made by the dispensary physicians to the depot, or lockup, at the prefecture of police, as there are always a certain number of prostitutes arrested for drunkenness or disorderly conduct every night. It was thought well to seize the opportunity of their confinement to inquire into their state of health. All houses of prostitution are visited by the dispensary physicians once a week. The hour of the visit is known beforehand, and every girl must be present and pass inspection. The examination is private, the result is noted in a folio kept by the physician, and a corresponding memorandum is made in the passbook of the house, and on the card of the prostitute. When disease is detected, the mistress of the house is notified, and cautioned not to allow the girl diseased to receive any visitors. That afternoon, or the next morning, she comes, or is brought to the dispensary, where she undergoes a second examination, and, if the result is the same as the first, she is forthwith sent to Saint-Lazare for treatment. Free prostitutes, that is to say, those who live in lodgings or rooms furnished by themselves, are bound to visit this dispensary and submit to examination once a fortnight. They choose the time and day themselves, but more than a fortnight must not elapse between the visits. It appears, from the tables published by M. Perrin du Châtelet, that these rules are strictly enforced. Free prostitutes are visited nearly thirty times a year, and prostitutes in tolerated houses more than fifty times. We have alluded elsewhere to the results of the visits. Experience has proved that the only safe method of punishment for prostitutes is imprisonment. Formerly they were whipped, and at a later date their hair was cut off. But the humane spirit of modern legislation has rejected both of these punishments as unduly cruel. At the present day, offenses against the rules concerning prostitution, zélite prostitution, are punished by imprisonment, misdemeanors and crimes provided against by the code being within the cognizance of ordinary courts in the case of prostitutes as well as other persons. Zélite's prostitution have been divided by the Bureau des Morts in two classes, slight offenses and grave offenses. Slight offenses are 1. To appear in forbidden places. 2. To appear at forbidden hours. 3. To get drunk and lie down in doorways, streets, or other thoroughfares. 4. To demand admittance to guardhouses. 5. To walk through the streets in daylight in such a way as to attract the notice of people passing. 6. To rap on the windows of their rooms. 7. To absent themselves from the medical inspection. 8. To beg. 9. To remain more than 24 hours in their house after being pronounced diseased by the physician. 10. To escape from the hospital or dispensary. 11. To go out of doors with bare head or neck. 12. To remain in Paris after having been ordered to leave and presented with a passport. This class of offenses is punished by imprisonment for not less than a fortnight or more than three months. One month is the usual term. A prostitute is held to be guilty of grave offenses when she 1. Insults outrageously the visiting physician. 2. Fails to visit the dispensary. 3. Continues to prostitute herself after being pronounced diseased. 4. Uses obscene language in public. 5. Appears naked in her window. 6. Assails men with violence and endeavors to drag them to her home. These offenses are punished by imprisonment for not less than three months and not more than a year, rarely more than six months. The time is fixed in these cases with reference to the former character of the prostitute. When a prostitute is arrested, she is taken to the prefecture of the police, where there is a room specially appropriated to her class. She is tried within 48, usually within 24 hours of her arrival. When condemned, she is conveyed in a closed carriage or van to the prison. The prison at Paris usually contains from 450 to 600 inmates. They are all obliged to work. A few are generally found incapable, either from idiocy, blindness, or incorrigible obstinacy, of performing even the simplest work. These are lodged in a department called the Ward of Imbeciles. The others are allowed to choose their work. The bulk naturally take to sewing. They are paid a small sum for what they do, partly as they proceed with the work, and the balance when they leave the prison. 
Industrious girls receive from the money coming to them from five to eight sous daily. But this, added to the ample food supplied by the prison, suffices for their wants, is proved by the frequent purchases they make of flowers and other superfluities. Formerly, prostitutes in prison were not expected to work, and at this period fights and disturbances were of constant occurrence. Now the discipline is excellent and the prisoners orderly. The only penalty for disobedience of rules or misconduct is close confinement in the cachotte. Emperant du Châtelet admits that the prison discipline is so gentle that the punishment has no terrors for prostitutes. It is quite common to find girls who have been there thirty times condemned to imprisonment. He recommends the use of the treadmill as a corrective. His experience led him to question the utility of nuns and priests in the prostitutes' prison. He does not think they do any good, and inclines to the belief that the counsels and visits of married women, who look rather to the moral than religious reform of the women, would be productive of more benefit. The old practice in France was to admit visitors to the prostitute's prison at certain hours and in a certain room, but this was found to be productive of great evils. The scenes in the visitor's room were outrageous, and a new system was accordingly adopted. No one was allowed to visit a prostitute but a bona fide relation, and even such a one was required to obtain a written permit from the prefecture of police. A certain number of prostitutes are sent every year to the prison of Saint-Denis. These are those who, from physical or mental infirmities, such as rectovaginal fistula, cancer, incurable organic disease, idiocy, etc., are incapacitated from pursuing their calling and run risk of starvation. Not more than eight or ten of these are sent to saint Denis in the course of a year. The mortality among them there is not less than 25% per annum. Until a few years ago, a tax was levied on the Paris prostitutes for the support of the dispensary. Each mistress of a house paid 12 francs per month, each girl living alone 3 francs per month. A fine of two francs was also laid on all prostitutes who were behind their time in visiting the dispensary. The product of these various taxes amounted to from seventy-five to ninety thousand francs per annum. The system was abolished on the ground of its immorality. A popular notion is said to have prevailed that the police received half a million or more from the tax on prostitution, and a tax on the administration in consequence or incessant. The police authorities gave way at last, and the municipal council in the city undertook to defray the cost of the dispensary for the future. Similar taxes appear to have existed at Lyon, Strasbourg, and other cities. Allusions have been made to inspectors. At the time, M. Perrin du Châtelet wrote that there were ten inspectors, who had each charge of one-tenth of the city. Their business was to see that the regulations governing prostitutes were carried out. They arrested offending women and transferred them to the prefecture of police. In case of resistance, they summoned the aid of the ordinary police of the ward. They were not allowed themselves to use violence, either to arrest or drag a girl to prison. They were usually picked men of good character. Their salary was 1,200 francs a year, besides hands and presents. In conclusion, a word must be said of the establishment called the Bon Pasteur. It is a Magdalene asylum established many years ago by some benevolent ladies, and now mainly supported by an annual vote from the city of Paris, and an allowance from the hospitals. It receives prostitutes who desire to reform, feeds, clothes, and instructs them, provides them with places when they desire to leave, or with work when they wish to remain in the establishment. The rule is that no prostitute can be received under 18 or over 25 years of age. Beyond these limits, it has been found that the humane efforts of the directress of the establishment have rarely led to any result. No compulsion is used in any case by the managers. Girls are free to leave as they are free to come. So long as they remain, however, they must conform to the rules of the establishment, which are strict without being monastic. The average admissions to the asylum for the first twelve years of its existence were twenty per annum. The mortality rate among the residents was very large, being equal to twenty per cent on the total number during the twelve years. Of the whole number, two hundred and forty-five, forty were dismissed for insubordination, twenty-seven left of their own accord and probably returned to their old courses, and fifteen were returned to the police. The remainder were either restored to their families or placed in situations in the hospitals or elsewhere. Small as these numbers appear in comparison with the large army of prostitutes exercising their calling at Paris, it is not at all doubtful that the establishment is a useful one. No one can help but concur with M. Perron du Châtelet when he observes that, to did not exist, it would be necessary to create it. Note, as M. Perron du Châtelet has written the best, we might almost say the only philosophical work on prostitution extent, and might be useful to subjoin the test of the statute which he proposed to regulate the subject of prostitution. Law Relative to the Repression of Prostitution Article 1. 
the duty of repressing prostitution, whether the provocation on the public highway or otherwise, is entrusted at Paris to the prefecture of police, and in all other communes of France to the mayors, respectively. Article 2. A discretionary authority over all persons engaged in public prostitution is vested in these functionaries, within the scope of their powers. Article 3. Shall constitute evidence of public prostitution either first, direct provocation thereto on a public highway, second, public notoriety, or third, legal proof adduced after accusation and trial. Article 4. The Prefect of Police at Paris and the mayors and other communes shall make any and all regulations which they may deem suitable for the repression of prostitution, and such regulations shall bear upon all those who encourage prostitution as a trade, lodgers, innkeepers, and tavern keepers, landlords, and tenants. Article 5. The dispensary at Paris for the superintendence of women of the town is placed on the same footing as the public health establishments. Other similar dispensaries may be established wherever they are needed. Article 6. A full report of the proceedings of these dispensaries shall be forwarded annually to the Minister of the Interior. M. du Châtelet conceived this short law to be adequate for the purpose. It may be presumed that he took for granted that the mayors of the communes would never attempt to carry out original views of their own on the subject. He doubtless gave them credit for sufficient self abnegation to adopt, without question, the elaborate and sensible plan which experience has taught the authorities of Paris. How far this assumption was justifiable appears uncertain, in view of the fact that as Lyons and Strasbourg, the prostitutional system has always differed from that of the capital. In both these cities, a tax has been levied on prostitutes till a very late period. At Lyons, it was exacted, it is believed, in 1842. End of section 12, chapter 10.